them in the second panel. The first panel, though, the uh, superintendent of the New York State Insurance Department and a former chief accountant with the Securities and Exchange Commission are expected to testify. Again, the uh, hearing should be getting started shortly. Our live coverage here on C-SPAN. Please come to order. Today we're holding our second day of hearings on the financial crisis in Wall Street. Yesterday we examined the collapse of Lehman Brothers. Our focus today is AIG. There are obvious differences between Lehman and AIG. Lehman is an investment bank. AIG is an insurance company. Lehman fell because it placed highly leveraged bets in the subprime and real estate markets. AIG's problems originate in the complex derivatives called credit default swaps. But their stories are fundamentally the same. In each case, the companies and their executives grew rich by taking on excessive risk. In each case, the companies collapsed when these risks turned bad. And in each case, their executives are walking away with millions of dollars while taxpayers are stuck with billions of dollars in costs. The AIG CEOs are like the layman CEO in one other respect. In each case, they refuse to accept any blame for what happened to their companies. In preparation for this hearing, the committee has received tens of thousands of pages of documents from AIG. Our review of the documents raise, raises three fundamental sets of questions. Answering these questions will be the focus of today's hearing. The first set of questions is whether AIG's executive compensation practices were fair and appropriate. AIG has a seniors partner plan that provides cash bonuses for its 70 executives. These are the top 70 executives. This plan is supposed to be performance based. In 2005, AIG's CEO, Martin Sullivan, received $2.7 million under this plan. In 2006, his first full year as CEO, he received $5.7 million under the plan. These payments are not in question. Both years were <coughs> good years for AIG, and as CEO, Mr. Sullivan naturally was well rewarded. 2007 is a completely different story. AIG lost over $5 billion in the final quarter of 2007 due to losses attributable to its financial products division called AIGFP. Under the terms of the senior partners plan, Mr. Sullivan and the other top executives should have had their bonuses slashed due to poor performance. But when the Compensation Committee met on March 11, 2008, the award bonuses for 2007, Mr. Sullivan urged the committee to ignore the losses from the Financial Products Division in calculating his bonus and the bonuses of the top, other top executives. We, we obtained a copy of the minutes from that meeting, and here's what they say. Mr. Sullivan next presented management's recommendation with respect to the uh, earnout for the senior partners plan, suggesting that the AIGFP unrealized market valuation losses be excluded from the calculation. The board approved this change in the senior partners plan, ignored the last losses from the financial products division, and gave Mr. Sullivan a cash bonus of over $5 million. Today we'll ask what could possibly justify this change in the compensation formula. There are other compensation questions we will also ask. 
In March, the Board approved a new compensation contract for Mr. Sullivan that gave him a golden parachute worth $15 million. We'll ask why that was in the interest of the shareholders. And we'll ask about the compensation of Joseph Cassano, who was the executive in charge of the Financial Products Division. Mr. Cassano was well compensated by AIG. He received more than $280 million over the last eight years. After his division imploded, AIG terminated him without cause in February and did not seek to recover any of Mr. Cassano's compensation. Instead, AIG allowed him to keep up to $34 million in unvested bonuses and put him on a $1 million a month retainer. Last month, the taxpayers bought out AIG in an $85 billion bailout. This was a direct result of the mistakes made by Mr. Cassano. Yet even today, he remains on the company payroll, receiving $1 million a month. The federal bailout occurred on September 16th. Less than one week later, AIG held a week-long retreat for company executives at the, at the exclusive St. Regis Resort in Monarch Beach, California. And uh, we have a photograph on display of that resort. Rooms at this resort can cost over $1,000 per night. Invoices provided to the committee show that AIG paid the resort over $440,000, including nearly $200,000 for rooms, over $150,000 for meals, and $23,000 in spa charges. Well, average Americans are suffering economically. They're losing their jobs, their homes, and their health insurance. Yet less than one week after the taxpayers rescued AIG, company executives could be found whining and dining at one of the most exclusive resorts in the nation. We'll ask whether any of this makes any sense. The second set of questions we'll ask is whether Mr. Sullivan and Robert Willumstad are right when they say they bear no responsibility for the collapse of AIG. Mr. Sullivan was CEO from March 2005 to June 2008. Mr. Willumstad was his successor. He joined the AIG board in January 2006 and served as chairman from November 2006 until he was named CEO in June 2008. According to their testimony, AIG failed because it was caught in a vicious cycle and hit by a global financial tsunami. Mr. Willemstad says, quote, I don't believe AIG could have done anything differently, end quote. The information we received paints a different picture. We have obtained a confidential letter from the Office of Thrift Supervision to AIG's general counsel. In this March 10, 2008 letter, the Office of Thrift Supervision writes, quote, we are concerned that the corporate oversight of AIG financial products lacks critical elements of independence, transparency, and granularity, end quote. Internal documents show that AIG's auditor, PricewaterhouseCooper, reported similar problems. Minutes from a meeting of the board's audit committee in March 2008 revealed that the PricewaterhouseCooper told the committee that the root cause of AIG's problems was that risk control groups did not have appropriate access to the financial products division. As part of our investigation, the committee requested inf information from a former AIG auditor, Joseph St. Denis. Mr. St. Denis was a senior SEC enforcement official who was hired by AIG to address its ongoing accounting problems. But when he expressed concerns about how the financial products division was valuing its liabilities, Mr. Cassano told him, I have deliberately excluded you from the valuation because I was concerned that you would pollute the process, end quote. Ultimately, Mr. St. Denis resigned in protest. 
As he explains, quote, Mr. Cassano took actions that I believe were intended to prevent me from performing the job duties for which I was hired. Unlike Mr. Cassano and Mr. Sullivan, Mr. St. Denis' actions cost him his bonus. There are other questionable actions by Mr. Sullivan and Mr. Willemstad. As losses were mounting and resources were getting scarce, AIG depleted its capital by over $10 million through stock buybacks and rising dividend payments. This prompted shareholders to write the board, quote, the management and board inexcusably and inexplicably raised the dividend while simultaneously issuing expensive preferred stock at a discount, end quote. And finally, we'll ask whether AIG, and in particular Mr. Sullivan, misled investors and the public about the financial conditions of the company. On December 5, 2007, Mr. Sullivan told investors, we are confident in our marks and the reasonableness of our valuation methods. We have a high degree of certainty in what we have booked to date, end quote. What Mr. Sullivan didn't tell investors was that on November 29th, one week earlier, Price Waterhouse Cooper had raised their concerns about Mr. Sullivan, informing him that PwC believed that AIG could have a material weakness relating to the risk management of these areas. There is one witness who should be here today, but who will be missing. Maurice Hank Greenberg, the longtime CEO of AIG. Mr. Greenberg blames Mr. Sullivan and Mr. Willemstad for the downfall of AIG. Many others think it is Mr. Greenberg who sowed the seeds that led to AIG's failure. Regrettably, Mr. Greenberg has told the committee that he is too ill to appear today to answer questions. There is a lot of ground for this committee to cover today. We will probe AIG's executive compensation arrangements, the leadership of its top officials, and the veracity of their public statements. Our goal is to examine the details of AIG's fall so that we can learn lessons about the reforms needed to restore stability to our financial mar markets. Like all of our witnesses, Mr. Sullivan and Mr. Willemstad know we will ask hard questions. I also want them and our other witnesses to know that we appreciate their cooperation and appearance before the committee today. Before yielding to uh, Mr. Shays, who will deliver the statement on behalf of the Republicans, I do want to announce that uh, the request that we have received to look at uh, Fannie Mae and uh, Freddie Mac, uh, which is uh, an investigation already underway, will, con will be pursued. Uh, in conjunction with the minority on the committee, and we will uh, look at holding a hearing on uh, those two as well as the other hearings that we have scheduled. Uh, Mr. Shays, I want to recognize you at this time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today we consider the case of the American International Group, AIG, a global insurance conglomerate saved from insolvency by an $85 billion loan from American taxpayers. As part of the deal, we, the American taxpayers, own a controlling stake in the company. In these bailouts, the United States Treasury is now in the business of picking winners and losers as the global economy struggles to purge the toxins of speculative greed polluting capitalism's bloodstream. We need to understand what makes a private company like AIG too big to fail and what drew such a large and venerable enterprise to the brink of failure. In the search for causes, all roads lead to the housing market, dominated by the Federal National Mortgage Association, Fannie Mae, and the Federal Home Loan Mortgage Corporation, Freddie Mac. Without question, mortgage-backed assets sliced and diced and scattered throughout the financial system lie at the epicenter of the economic earthquake shaking world markets. Ripples from defaults on subprime loans, underwritten by Fannie and Freddie, grew to a tsunami that helped swamp Lehman Brothers and others, including AIG. And Fannie and Freddie were able to launch more than $1 trillion, $1 trillion of bad paper 
into the private market because regulators and Congress let them do it. This committee cannot conduct a credible examination of the current crisis without focusing on the market distorting power of the federal mortgage giants and the firewall against reform manned by their enablers here in Congress. No one is disputing the committee's focus on executive pay. We agree company compensation is a telling indicator of a corporate culture detached from larger market realities and the fundamental fiduciary duty to be frugal stewards of other people's money. And that me first self-indulgence was just as rampant at Fannie Mae as in its private sector partners and competitors. From 1998 to 2003, Fannie Mae CEO Franklin Raines alone took over $90 million in salary and bonuses. The Raines team was even caught manipulating accounting practices to overstate profitability so they could grab what their overseer called, quote, ill-gotten bonuses in the hundreds of millions of dollars. The Fannie Mae board gave recent ousted CEO Dan, Daniel Mudd a 2.6 million bonus in 2005 on top of his $3.5 million salary based on a set of non-financial goals such as promoting respect, appropriate and productive relationship with regulators. In the context of a $6 trillion mortgage securities profile portfolio, those paydays may seem like small change, but it's indicative of a prevalent and noxious rot that threatens the moral underpinnings of the entire capitalist business model. So we need to keep the toxic twins, Fannie and Freddie, at the center of this investigation, not on the edge, not out in the future, but right now. Yesterday, we sent a formal request to the chairman asking for a specific commitment to make the federal mortgage companies a priority in this hearing, not an afterthought. We can't wait until Halloween to unmask these two failed monsters of mortgage finance. As for AIG, I am interested in learning more about the corporate decision making that took a solid insurance business into the far less stable world of credit default, swaps, and other exotic derivatives. They thought they were selling insurance when in fact they were betting the company's soul in a high stakes game of Russian roulette. We need to ask what AIG knew about the risk behind these novel products, when they knew the bet soured, and how they informed investors, policyholders, regulators, and the public that the company was in peril. AIG, like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, was considered too big to fail. Going forward, we need to grapple with the implications of the concept government will be there to break the fall of some large businesses, but not others. It's been said capitalism without failure is like religion without sin. Any doctrine loses its moral authority when bad conduct is rewarded and the consequences of poor choices are foisted on someone else. Investigating the causes and effects of this financial debacle should involve assigning capability, culpability, and restoring integrity and balance to the system of risks, rewards, and penalties our society uses to assign value to labor, capital, and commerce. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Shays. For our first panel, we'll hear from Lynn Turner, who served as Chief Accountant of the Securities and Exchange Commission from 1998 to 2001. He has served on the boards of public companies as a professor of accounting, as a partner in an auditing firm, and as the managing director of a research firm. He is currently a senior advisor at, at Kroll, Inc. Eric Danalo currently serves as a superintendent of the New York State Insurance Department. From 1999 to 2003, he served as the Chief of the Securities Bureau at the New York State Attorney General's Office. Mr. Danalo has also served as General Counsel at a large insurance broker and as Managing Director for Regulatory Affairs at Morgan Stanley. We are pleased to welcome both of you to our hearing this morning. 
Um, it, it, it's the practice of this committee that all witnesses that testify before us do so under oath, so I'd like to ask if you would stand and raise your right hand. <clears throat> do you solemnly swear that the testimony you'll give before the committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? The record will indicate that both of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. You have given us prepared statements, uh, some quite lengthy, and I want you to know that all of those uh, statements, both of those statements, uh, prepared statements, will be in the record in its entirety. What we'd like to ask you to do is um, try to be mindful of uh, five minutes uh, that we allocate to the oral presentation. We won't cut you off if you exceed five minutes, but we will have a clock in front of you that will be green for four minutes. For the last minute, will turn yellow. After five minutes, will turn red. And then uh, we would like you to then uh, wind down your uh, presentation. Mr. Danalo, why don't we start with you? Thank you, Chairman. It's an honor to be here. Um, I'm here to try to explain from our perspective a little bit about what happened at AIG and what the uh, New York State Insurance Department's a, 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 a role in that was. Um, the Insurance Department regulates uh, certain insurance companies, and I think that's a very important distinction to make at the beginning. Uh, AIG was not strictly an insurance company, as was said earlier. It was probably the largest financial services company in the world. Um, and in fact, I think its economic activity on the financial services side exceeded its economic activity on the insurance side. I agree that a large number of the problems there were due to credit um, uh, default swaps and collateralized debt obligations stemming from subprime and the mortgage industry. But that activity was largely, if not exclusively, done out of financial products division which was a sort of a subsidiary of the holding company. Um, the most immediate problem that got our uh, attention was the pending downgrade of the company. So one of the rating agencies had threatened on, I think it was September I don't know, a ninth or so, to downgrade the company. That's when I received a call from the general counsel and the former CFO asking if we would be able to help provide certain liquidity through the insurance subsidiaries, which were very solvent, well capitalized. For the time before that, we had been monitoring the situation, but it was a monitoring of the situation based on the declining stock price of the company and our wanting to confirm that the insurance subsidiaries were solvent and policyholders were protected. So it was in those conditions that we showed up at the company on Friday, Saturday and Sunday, the long weekend which went into Monday and Tuesday at the Federal Reserve where different private solutions were looked at. We, we, uh, the history is well written now in the press, but I can answer questions about that. But the solvency uh, problem was fine. The liquidity problem kept on growing over the weekend and the whole looked larger and larger. And whatever we could have done through New York State, uh, which the governor um, of New York, David Patterson, had authorized us to try to help do, became um, not uh, um, enough. And we ended up with a larger and larger liquidity holder problem. Um, we were there to validate the concerns of the company, which were true. We were also there, I think, uh, um, to validate for the Federal Reserve that there was real solvency and capital in the insurance companies, which was what the bed rock of the transaction was. In other words, the $85 billion could not have been loaned if there was not any hope of getting the money back. And to a large extent, whatever returns they are going to be are because of the um, uh, um, um, robustness of the insurance company. To a large extent, I agree. I think that AIG got well away from its core competency of insurance. It went into very complex instruments called credit default swaps, which I can explain some of the basics as I've been asked. Um, but overall, the state regulation of it, I think, worked quite well. Uh, it is a lesson for us to talk about, I hope, about what is the right way to regulate um, holding company undertakings. Um, there were 71 U.S. insurance companies. Um, as I said, without them, there would not um, have been a, a bailout, but to an almost exclusive extent, the problem was caused by activities conducted out of financial products. Those activities were largely through the writing of credit default swaps. 
There are um, a legitimate need for hedging of risk, which was the beginning of credit default swaps probably in the 1980s. Um, it's where you own a bond, let's just say, and you own Ford bonds and you want to um, hedge your risk that Ford is going to default on those bonds. So you go to a third party and you ask them to essentially insure you against that default. That's the swap. That's the part of the swap. You're swapping the risk of the default with a third party. Um, that is called hedging also. And it is often also called insurance in the sense you're buying insurance against the default of the bond. But I think that the, that the committee should know that that is now only about 10 percent or so of credit default swaps that are outstanding in the world. There are probably over $60 trillion of credit default swaps. A overwhelmingly high percentage are what um, I uh, termed a couple months ago naked credit default swaps. What that means is you enter into a contract with a party. Neither of you own any exposure to Ford. You're just taking a bet. You're taking a gamble on whether Ford is going to default or enter into bankruptcy or not. It's a form of shorting. It's the way we short the credit worthiness of our industries. It is far larger than the equity shorting. And you've heard about naked shorting in the equities market and how Chairman Cox um, asked to have that prohibited and did. It's interesting that on the bond side, on, on the uh, credit worthiness side, we've permitted this to run completely unchecked to the point that it is larger than the entire economic output of the world annually. That's where we are on credit default swaps. And the governor has said that he's willing to regulate the piece that we can, which is the insurance piece. That original 10 percent, we can easily call an insurance product. We can regulate that because it is an insurance transaction. As I described, you own the bonds. You have exposure. You are not going to the track and placing a bet, and that is when you get your exposure. And we can do um, that, and the Governor has announced that as of January 1st, if there is not a more holistic solution through a central counterparty clearing or um, an exchange or some kind of clearinghouse, that the Governor um, and the Insurance Department um, is willing to do that to help sort of clarify uh, what Chairman Cox called uh, the regulatory black hole of, um, of credit default swaps. I will note, just because I'm in front of Congress and maybe this is helpful, that it required the Commodity Futures Modernization Act of 2000, which I believe was a statute passed by Congress, to um, exempt credit default swaps, the naked kind that I described, from being subject to the gaming laws of the various states and the, what are called the bucket shop laws. That's a very, it's kind of funny, but it, it is kind of funny. There, I can read to you um, that there's a law that's directly on point that prohibits um, that kind of activity, entering into this agreement without any exposure to the reference. And it required the CFMA to say that's not gambling. Um, and likewise, as Chairman Cox pointed out, it also was required that it be not a security, otherwise it would have been regulated by the SEC. So the CFMA both in one fell swoop said uh, CDSs are not a security and they are also not subject to the gaming laws of the land. And I think when, um, when you talk about moral hazard and the way they got it right in the 20s, which is the law that I am referencing was in 1907. Um, they probably understood some things then that we sort of forgot along the way, and now we're 63 trillion um, to the worse. Later on, I can read you if you'd like, but um, it's pretty well established, and I think it's something that we should at least examine, along with whether um, Glass-Steagall was such a mistake or not, and other ways that we sort of protect our depository institutions, like insurance companies and commercial banks, from attendant activities at the holding company level. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Donalo. Mr. Turner. Thank you, uh, Chairman uh, Waxman, committee members. Uh, I think this is a very important hearing in light of the fact that we are watching millions of Americans uh, lose their jobs. Um, they have lost their homes. And now, as we watch the stock market come down, they are also losing their savings. Much of this is destruction and devastation, I think, that could have and, quite frankly, should have been avoided. But in the words of the Could you pull the mic a little closer to you? And there is a button on the base. I think yeah, it's on. It's on. Is okay. that better? Yes. Good. I'm sorry. But in the words of the philosopher George Santana, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it, and certainly we fall in that category today. 
AIG serves as a reminder and unfortunate but excellent example of what is wrong with our financial system today. While there are many capital participants that have operated within sound business, ethical and legal boundaries, there have been far too many that have not. We began the decade with the mess around names such as Enron uh, WorldCom, followed by the uh, uh, Wall Street analyst scandal, then on to mutual fund late trading and market timing, then the stock option backdating at such companies as United Health, and now we find ourselves in the midst of uh, the biggest and by far away the most destructive of all the subprime fiasco. Uh, this is a crisis that could have, and in my opinion, uh, should have been averted before it cost American taxpayers what appears to be may, uh, be in excess of a trillion dollars before we're all said and done with it. And certainly there's plenty of blame to go uh, around. Uh, all of us, uh, I think, probably share in that to some degree. But I hope the focus of Congress and this committee will be on a bipartisan basis uh, holding hearings that, much like an investigation occurs when a plane crash goes down, determines what went wrong and then promptly turns around and, and fixes it so we don't repeat history. From my perspective, some of the causes of this economic crisis include executives and mortgage brokers engaging in unsound, if not illegal, business practices, compensation and incentives resulting in some business executives being paid both coming and going as they walked away from the equivalent of, quite, uh, quite frankly, a train wreck with huge severance packages that their corporate boards actually agreed to accounting standard setters who failed to provide the markets with the necessary transparency, woefully inadequate due diligence by investment banks underwriting the securities, cheap debt uh, set up by our uh, monetary policy uh, people that created low interest rates and led to tremendous leverage and debt in this country. As Eric mentioned, a $62 trillion unregulated uh, credit derivative market which had absolutely no transparency whatsoever. Uh, the SEC being handcuffed by a lack of resources, lack of regulatory authority, and changes in policy that no doubt have hampered enforcement, the lack of a regulator that could regulate at the holding company level for national and global insurance companies, and the failure of the Federal Reserve and banking regulators who exams failed to identify and rectify unsound lending practices at institutions such as IndyMac, WAMU, Countrywide, and Citigroup. And often these practices led to what is our fundamental problem, loans got made that people could not re repay. In addition, policymakers and regulators have allowed financial institutions to merge and grow into colossal entities that have shown they can have a devastating impact on an economy when they get into trouble. Some are arguing that, as we have heard, they are now too large to fail. And with their failure now, though, resulting in taxpayers paying hundreds of billions to rescue them, it is time to examine good public policy to ensure regulation of these entities provide much greater transparency, freedom from some of the conflicts we have seen, accountability for their actions and oversight. Investor confidence is paramount to the success of any capital market, and transparency is what creates that confidence. Indeed, it is the lifeblood of any capital market system. When people believe they can no longer trust those for whom they invest their money, they withdraw it quickly and find safer havens for it, as we are seeing today. And when they demand their money back from a financial institution for fear of losing it, it can cause a serious liquidity crisis and failure, as we have seen at Bear Stearns, Lehman, and others. And as the money dries up and the demand for investment in the stock of these institutions falls, so does their stock price making capital difficult, if not impossible, to raise. It is a vicious cycle, but it is one that has occurred many times in the past. More specifically, with respect to AIG, there has been, in my opinion, poor management and governance. It has led to a poor tone at the top and last lack of risk management controls. Uh, I heard the Chairman talk about Mr. St. Dennis and, and uh, his concerns. Mr. St. Dennis worked for me at the SEC. He worked for me when I was a partner in the accounting firm, and, the, and his credibility is beyond repro reproach, and I would seriously consider the comments that he has provided you. The company is engaged in questionable business practices, including assisting others uh, engage in illegal activities. This, along with the constant slew of errors being reported in its financial statements, have led to various investigation by legal authorities and sanctions. This is not a company that has a good track record. 
and in addition, opaque disclosure have been less than forthcoming. In the summer of 2007, an AIG executive said that the company would not incur a dollar of loss, not incur a dollar of loss on its derivatives. Yet by December of last year, counterparties to the credit insurance required posting a collateral of over $5 billion, a number that had grown to $14 billion as of June of 2008. And in a stunning revelation, the company disclosed on October 3rd that it borrowed $61 billion of the $85 billion made available to it by the Federal Reserve. The rapid changing disclosures on this from zero to $61 billion in less than 12 months is phenomenal and investors certainly have to be raised and did we get this question of did we get the straight scoop uh, back a year ago. At the same time, AIG in a move that appears to deflect criticism blamed its problems on accounting rules which require it to disclose losses to its investors. This is like blaming the thermometer folks for a fever. As we saw with the savings and loan crisis and as the GAO, Congress's own watchdog has reported at the time, the ability of financial institutions to, reporting, uh, to avoid reporting declines in the value of assets contributes to unsound business practices and large losses for the government who has to step in with a bailout. Again, we should not forget the past and repeat these costly mistakes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Turner. We will now uh, recognize members for five minutes each to uh, ask uh, the two of you questions. And I want to recognize uh, Ms. Maloney first. Th thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I would like to welcome our panelists uh, and thank them for their public service, particularly Mr. Danalo from New York State. Uh, thank you and the Governor for your creative response to uh, the AIG crisis. Uh, uh, last night and this morning I have been criticized by some pundits uh, for my line of questioning on deregulation. Uh, some of them called it partisan. I, I just want to begin by saying that uh, our financial crisis is not a partisan issue. I truly do believe that every Republican, Democrat, independent, conservative, uh, liberal are dedicated to working towards a solution. And I believe the members of Congress want to find a solution. I am going to ask questions on deregulation and the relationship to the problems we confront. But I want to preface it by saying I am not being partisan. I am not criticizing anyone or any act or any particular thing. I am just trying to understand uh, more about it. And so with that being said, I would like to ask Mr. Danalo a few questions about the lack of regulation around uh, credit default swaps, which seem to be at the center of AIG's downfall. Credit default swaps are basically insurance contracts to protect against defaults on bonds and loans. It is an enormous market. Since 2000, it has exploded from $900 billion to $58 trillion. That is roughly twice the size of the entire United States stock market. It is also bigger, I understand, than the annual output of the entire world economy for one year. And yet, incredibly, the market uh, for credit default swaps is entirely unregulated. Although they operate like an insurance uh, contracts, parties selling these guarantees are not required to have capital reserves to protect the other party. And I would first like to ask, because they are so huge, $58 trillion, if there is no value behind them, as some economists allege, uh, do they, could they bring down our entire economy? Well, uh, I guess we are going to find out. Um, it, I hope not. But I will say that the distinction between credit default swaps and insurance policies is when you write insurance policy, you are required to have a certain amount of solvency and capital behind that commitment. For a large, large, large percentage of credit default swaps, you are required to have absolutely no collateral or capital behind them. I, I do agree that it is interesting to note that, as um, uh, Lynn said, it is, it is not you know, insider trading or late trading or the analyst cases or um, lax regulation or firm regulation or hard enforcement or soft enforcement that brought down the global economy, I think it is politically neutral to observe. It is what we chose not to regulate. 
And I don't think that's actually very partisan at all. I think we, as a country in 2000, made certain choices uh, uh, along Graham, Leach, Bliley, and uh, the uh, CFMA to permit this kind of activity as being a way to, ironically, to hedge risk. This is the ironic part. CDSs were meant to hedge risk. But they multiplied risk incredibly, in part because now only about 10 percent of what you have described is actually an insurance policy kind of transaction. The rest is really just a bet about the future of a company's creditworthiness. So are these uh, products just gambling, as well, you Well, the mentioned. Governor called them gambling. Mm -hmm. um, we had I the think if it were if it and we, we banned it in New York State. I think the and reason the that the commodities law usurped our position, and do you think that that should we be did, changed? We did ban it. In 1909, after the crash of 1907, we banned this kind of activity that used to be done in bucket shops where they would just take bets on the market, bucket the trades. And yes, um, that is what we did. It, and it required this. And no lawyer, no good lawyer could convince a client that a naked credit default swap was not also possibly prosecutable as gaming. So the CFMA, uh, appropriately, because we do need some kind of futures market, there is a role here, but it completely exempted them and the results are in part what you see today, which is not necessarily all about credit default swaps, as Lynn said, but also just the opacity. Do you? One of the important points, I think, is when we were working through the bond insurers, AMBAC and MBIA and all the work we did on those, as you know, and on AIG, no one, including ISDA, could tell you how much credit default swaps were written on those entities as reference points. So if AIG had failed, no one knew how much CDS was written on AIG. Mm -hmm. yeah. My time has expired. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Maloney. <laughs> Mr. Micah. Thank you. Um, first of all, let me say that uh, I'm pleased that uh, we may be looking at uh, Fannie Mae and some of uh, uh, its responsibility in uh, fermenting the financial crisis and, and mess that we see right now. Um, I'm disappointed, though, that uh, we didn't start with some of the culprits, and uh, we should actually have uh, reviewed some of uh, what took place with the federal uh, backed agency that uh, helped, again, uh, get us started down this wrong path. Uh, yesterday and today we are sort of splashing around in uh, the waiting pool and um, we really need to be looking at the cesspool. Uh, we are talking today about AIG, a private firm, uh, now with government backing, but it was a private firm and yesterday about Lehman Brothers, a uh, private investment uh, firm, uh, and uh, their compensation, they are running away with uh, millions of dollars, of investor dollars, and we are ignoring the core uh, perpetrator of all this, uh, Fannie Mae, uh, whose exec executives ran away with, uh, with tens of million dollars in public-backed uh, bonuses, uh, public-backed activities. Uh, is it correct that uh, AIG and Lehman are private investor firms as opposed to Fannie Mae? Mr. Yes. Turner, and they, just for the record, they both nodded their heads affirmatively. Mr. Turner, I read your written testimony. I agree with most of it. Uh, you didn't mention Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. Um, were their practices in any way contributory to the financial mess we are in? I have actually done work on behalf of Ofeo at both Fannie and Freddie. Just okay, so that then you, I don't want to hear and, your and, opinion. But let me just say that I see great similarities between both of those institutions mm -hmm. and AIG, uh -huh. and I, I applaud you for very highly for taking a look at those two, because I don't see a well, whole I lot of distinction. I want to do more than applaud, because if this committee isn't going to investigate, uh, I intend to ask the, the now uh, the special counsel statute has expired, but it's my understanding the, uh, that the attorney general uh, can help us drain the swamp and go after those who created the cesspool. 
And I'm going to ask my fellow Republicans and Democrats to, to consider uh, asking the Attorney General to get, go after those folks who rob the American uh, taxpayer and start with Fannie Mae, which is a federally backed institution, which you both nodded to, uh, which started, in my opinion, this whole mess. There were contributing factors. Glass-Steagall, did that contribute? Yes? Can, just answer yes, if, if Mr. Turner, you think Glass-Steagall, the repeal, did it? I think the repeal of Glass-Steagall okay. was a contributing factor here. Mr. Commissioner there? Uh, yes? I, I, okay. I agree. Okay, and you, now one of the interesting things too is New York uh, did, in most cases, the states were pretty good regulators of insurance. Is that correct? Within Thank you. Yes, I think the record have. would. I think the record would support the that. The default swap got is is really out of your purview. But even regulation of Fannie Mae and what they were doing, and, and uh, some of the activities that took place with government-sponsored uh, financial enterprises. Uh, 2002, uh, Mr. Shays and I introduced uh, a, a law that would have brought uh, this activity under the SEC. That would have helped regulate it. 2004, it was, was introduced and passed actually, I think, in 2005 by the, the House and blocked in the Senate. Is that right? Would, would that have you? Did you it see it was actually, it was Congressman Frank much to his credit, did introduce legislation that got passed in the House over here, and I applaud but all the But it was House. blocked in the Senate. But it was not passed in the Senate, and that was greatly unfortunate. Yes, and I voted against it. Uh, now, Glass Steagall, uh, Mr. Waxman, and I voted against not to repeal that. We v voted opposite for the regulation in 2005. But the responsibility lies with Congress, not with the state of New York Department of, of Insurance or some other state to regulate and go after some of these uh, speculative investment activities at that level. Is that not right, Mr. Uh, the responsibility of the state regulators, which I think they executed on extremely well here, yes, was but, to... But you couldn't control the situation, is that correct? To, to protect to protect policy holders and protect the solvency it, of the insurance companies. It's the responsibility of the Congress of the United States, and also it's the responsibility of the Congress to start first with its and clean up its own dirty cesspool, which is Fannie Mae, and we still don't have a commitment on, or a date uh, to do that. And I know exactly why. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And um, Mr. Chairman, I, um, and to uh, the uh, our witnesses, I want to thank you all for being here. And uh, my constituents are concerned about where the $700 billion is going. They want to know. Um, because they get up every morning, they work hard, they give up their tax dollars, and they're trying to figure out where did the money go, where is it going. Mr. Turner and Mr. Danalo, after the bailout of AIG last month, the United States government effectively bought an 80 percent share in the company. That should have caused a fundamental change, you would think, in how the company was spending funds on compensation, bonuses and benefits. But it doesn't look like that's what happened. The com committee learned that shortly after the bailout went through, executives from AIG's major U.S. life insurance subsidiary, AIG American General, held a week-long conference at an exclusive resort in California. The resort is called the St. Regis Monarch Beach. Let me put up some pictures of the hotel up on the screen. It's very impressive. Uh, this is a, an exclusive resort. The rooms start, gentlemen, at $425 a night. Some are more than $1,200 a night. By the way, that's more than some of my constituents pay on a mortgage payment every month in the homes that they are now losing, by the way. We contacted the resort where AIG held this week-long event, and we requested copies of AIG's bills. We learned that AIG spent nearly half a million dollars in a single week after, at this hotel. Now, this is right after the bailout. Mr. Turner, have you heard of anything more outrageous? A week after the taxpayers commit $85 billion to rescue AIG, the company's leading insurance executives spend hundreds of thousands of dollars at one of the most exclusive resorts in the nation. Mr. Turner? I, I've been a business executive myself, and, and I tell you what, when, uh, when our company 
you know, when things got tough, you, you cut back on expenses. You just go out and eliminate those type of things. I'm, I'm sure they had the issue. They were probably already committed to it and we're going to have to spend it one way or another. But nonetheless, I remember we, uh, as a business executive, uh, VP and CFO of a company, we would actually go out and cancel those conferences because we just didn't want to send a message to the employees that, that we're spending on this type of thing and we need to cut back expenses. So. Um, uh, and if, and if, a company, out, uh, and if a company is drowning, then you're going to go and spend that kind of money? It's crazy, and I, I agree with you. Yeah. Let me describe uh, for some of you the charges that the, the shareholders who are now U.S. taxpayers had to pay. Check this out. AIG spent $200,000 for hotel rooms and almost $150,000 for catered banquets. AIG spent, listen to this one. $23,000 at the hotel spa and another $1,400 at the salon. They were getting their manicures, their facials, their pedicures, and their massages while American people were, were footing the bill. And they spent another $10,000 for, I don't know what this is, leisure dining. At bars? Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Donalo, let me ask you, uh, not as the insurance commissioner, but as a taxpayer, does this look right to you? Um, I think there are some regrettable um, headlines in that. But I will say one thing, having been at large global companies, um, and knowing what condition AIG was in when the injection occurred, the absolute worst thing that could have happened to AIG after the government extended $85 billion would have been for them to basically go into a runoff situation, for employees to leave, for traders and, and major underwriters to flee the company. So if there was a thinking that they needed to bring everybody together in order to keep the productivity of the insurance companies intact and protect policyholders by keeping them from going into a runoff status, I do agree there is some profligate spending there, but the concept of bringing all the major employees together, let me just, to, to ensure that the $85 billion could be as greatly as possible paid back would have been not a crazy corporate decision. Well, I would tend to disagree with you when it comes to pedicures, facials, I, manicures. I, the American people I agree. are paying for that. I agree. I'm just and they're to, very upset. I, I, I said there are regrettable and wrong headlines in that. But the, uh, but the idea of, of making sure that you can get the game plan back on track so you can pay off the loan is not a, 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 an, an irrational It's an expensive one. way to get the game plan, plan back on track. I, I, I agree. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Bilbrick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Chairman, let me say personally, thank you very much for committing to uh, do a hearing on the Freddie and Fannie. I appreciate you doing that. I hope we can get that date. Um, I think that as Mr. Turner, I appreciate your frankness of saying, even though I'm not talking about it, we need to go back and look, uh, concentrate on Freddie and Fannie. And I appreciate, Mr. Chairman, your, your ability to respond to that, that reality. Um, and in fact, Mr. Chairman, I would, I would almost say that we may be sitting in a situation that now that Freddie and Fannie has become public agencies, that we may want to talk to the Attorney General about the possibility of a special prosecutor to go in and take a look at that as one of the public agencies. And I think that's important to show the American people we really are serious at getting to correcting some of these problems and really doing it based on um, an in-depth um, um, study of the problem. Uh, let, me, let me sort of backtrack. Um, this issue of the, uh, the credit swaps, it seems like there are two, there's a balancing line here where it is an insurance hedge and then they move into a gambling. Now, the preemption that the Feds put in to say it is not gambling totally, wouldn't you agree that maybe we got to go back and revisit that and try to develop a, a bright line between what is gambling and the states can intervene on as opposed to what is insurance and states can't intervene in? Uh, yes. What I would have done is I would have said that each one of those activities had to get some kind of an exemption activity by activity. So there is a good argument 
that sort of in crop insurance and you need futures to protect yourself against crop failure, et cetera. There are lots of hedging activities that are kind of on the border. You do not, you don't maybe absolutely own the security or the bond, but you do have exposure. But we basically, through the law I could read to you, we completely exempted all of it. Um, and um, I think it needs to be seriously revisited. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is the type of line that I wish, instead of just us meeting, and maybe we ought to ask the Speaker to reconvene the um, Financial Services Committee to meet now, not out a month from now, to talk about the specific proposals that the House could come back into session and address. Gentlemen, if you were in Congress, you were a member of Congress and maybe the Financial Services Committee, what changes and what proposals would you propose to the Speaker of the House of Representatives, to the President and the Leader of the Senate at this time and place? Uh, I, would, I would first uh, revisit the CFMA on its accredited default swap decisions, that it is a completely uh, unregulated and open field and that it is neither a security nor subject to the gaming laws and get back to the hedging instrument, which is, I think, core for our society and appropriate. I would take a serious look at uh, uh, Graham Leach Bliley and decide whether the supermarket of financial services is worth it when sometimes um, things really uh, smell on aisle six and infect the rest of what we view as kind of sacred uh, stuff, which is depository money, whether it is insurance policy proceeds or banking, commercial banking deposits, there needs to be a greater clarity about how the holding company activities, which here did not bring down the insurance companies but did ding them from a franchise value greatly, can harm those two depository type institution activities and whether it is always good to just let them willy-nilly be together under a holding company type umbrella. Congressman Bill Bray, you actually raise a, a very good question. My, my first comment would be that certainly I think the American public were concerned about how quick we ran into the $700 billion bailout, but I do applaud you for doing the bailout. I think without a doubt it needed to be done. could have been done perhaps in, in a different fashion, but I, I think the public is looking for Congress to do what this committee, and I agree with you, what the Financial Services and the Senate Banking Co Committee should be doing, and that is immediately holding a series of hearings, uh, just like the PCORA hearings were held in the 30s. We need a set of hearings that first identify where each of the issues and problems are, and, and it should be all inclusive. It should be the whole swamp, as people mentioned. Let's drain it all out and then turn around, and once we know where each of the issues are, bring in very knowledgeable people like a Chairman Volcker, like a Chairman Levitt and, and, and the type to turn around and uh, get the best of their thinking. And then with that, then let's go uh, take a real good shot at putting in the things that need to be, be fixed. And there's, there's a, a gob of things. There's questions about who should be doing the examination of these. There's questions about uh, failures at the Fed and failures at the SEC. Do we need to restructure those examination functions, which I think we probably do? Do we have adequate resources? Uh, do we need to repeal Graham Leach or the uh, Graham Leach Bliley in light of what's happened with the growth of these institutions and the too big to fail? Certainly, there's things that need to be done in terms of transparency because both in the credit derivatives market. Uh, as well as some of the other subprime stuff, there has been a tremendous, tremendous lack of transparency, which has directly contributed to the lack of confidence. And I serve on two, the boards of two investment funds, and right now people can't tell which companies they can trust and which ones they can't because of that lack of transparency. Until we get that problem solved, we are going to continue to see days like we saw yesterday in the stock market. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I just got back from my district, and the outrage is not that we threw money at the problem, but that we th threw money at the problem and look like we have walked away for a month. And if it is such a crisis to throw that much money out there, my constituents are saying there should be a crisis that you get in and not walk away from answers or demanding answers to solve the problem. Thank you very much for the chance to be able to question the, the Thank panel. Thank you very much, Mr. Bilbray. Of course, that is the purpose of this hearing. Uh, Mr. Kucinich. Thank you, very, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to uh, Mr. Dinalo, 
Treasury Secretary Paulson is the former CEO of Goldman Sachs. Uh, Mr. Paulson, of course, was involved in helping to save AIG, and Goldman Sachs is AIG's largest trading partner. News reports say that Goldman Sachs had at least $20 billion at stake uh, in AIG. Uh, now, uh, you, sir, it said, were uh, involved in negotiations to rescue AIG. Uh, was the CEO of Goldman Sachs, Lloyd Blankfein, and other Goldman Sachs executives present at meetings to save AIG? Yes. Could, could you speak into the mic? Yes. Was uh, Secretary Paulson at any of those meetings? N none that I was present at. Uh, do you have any knowledge that Secretary Paulson was present at any meetings relating to uh, saving uh, AIG? I, I can't, I'm not trying to avoid the answer. I just had no personal knowledge of that. Do you have knowledge that he was the former CEO of Goldman oh, Sachs? Oh, abs oh, absolutely. Oh, I can talk to you. Oh, I'm happy to talk to you about this. I just, you, you're, you're asking me yes or no questions, and I'm, and I'm finding did, it hard to... Be, before the bailout, did uh, Secretary Paulson or other federal officials raise concerns about the impact that the AIG collapse would have on Goldman Sachs? Yes, but not only Goldman Sachs. In, in fact, if I, if I may, I'll just tell you that I, I, I admire um, Tim Geithner, the president of the Federal Reserve. He has taught me various techniques in working through some of these problems. One of them is he I'm believes... I'm not really asking you well, let me, well, let me, well, Mr. Geithner, well, well, so I, well, I want to well, know... I just want to finish. Uh, please, sir, I'll just... But, but I, you're I, on I my promise. time, and you, I want well, you to answer my questions. But, now, my but question is, the, the head of global commerce yes. for Lehman sent an email on July 13, 2008, to Lehman's CEO, which said, and I quote from it, it is very clear GS, speaking of Goldman Sachs, mm -hmm. is driving the bus with the hedge fund cabal and greatly influencing downside momentum, meaning that Goldman Sachs was working to intentionally drive down the price of Lehman's stock. This was in mid-July. Two months later, Lehman went down with tremendous impact on the market and an impact all over the world. But AIG was saved. Now, what I'm trying to find out, you know, if Lehman's uh, uh, death was uh, natural causes or murder. Now, we're told that Secretary Paulson, as a um, um, former CEO of Goldman Sachs, has brought in another former Goldman Sachs employee to manage the $700 billion bailout fund. Now, Mr. Danalo, you are the superintendent of New York Insurance. You're yes. a regulator. As a regulator, do you have any concerns that Mr. Paulson, uh, as the former head of Goldman Sachs, uh, was and continues to be in a position of conflict of interest with respect to uh, being able to make decisions that would enhance the uh, position of Goldman Sachs uh, or uh, be able to uh, make decisions that would adversely affect those who might be in competition with Goldman Sachs. As a, as a regulator, do you have any of those concerns? I can't. I, 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 from what I witnessed in the four days and five days that I was exposed to what I was exposed to, based on my personal knowledge, I don't have concerns. I can't personally attest to Secretary Paulson's management of whatever conflicts of interest. So your answer interest. is you don't know? Well, my answer is I, I don't. I don't feel I have the basis to answer the question asked. Okay. I, I could. I, I could give you reasons that I you, think AIG I'm was treated differently than Lehman. Mr. I'd Chairman, be happy to do that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman yields back his time. Uh, the, the chair next recognizes Mr. Souter. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this this unbridled uh, greed. This this um, callous abuse of of the trust. Uh, of hardworking Americans' savings, it's, it's just so disgusting. It's hard to put into words, uh, and the anger level in America is coming, uh, as it often has, directly at Wall Street, but it, but at everybody. They're they're worried they're going to lose everything they work to save, because some people were living so high on the hog, so disrespectful of what was going on. The, the issue with that uh, hotel wasn't the amount of money. It's the insensitivity of how people behave with our, our dollars. And it, it, it's just uh, massive discouragement to, to all of us. That um, I wanted to ask a few questions about the, uh, 
state insurance fund first in, in New York. Um, is there sufficient guidelines to wall off uh, the divisions from dipping in when they're dealing with these credit futures and, and money market things and so on to the insurance reserves? How is that walled off? Yeah, that's what I am. Um, I think the system worked well because there's a fairly strong regulatory moat around each of the insurance operating companies versus the holding companies. So I think that there's an, there was kind of an instinct at AIG that maybe there was more capital for liquidity purposes than was really available. And that's how they got arguably into their liquidity crunch. Do investors? Because you require, so, so policyholders are extremely well protected from the holding companies reaching into the operating companies for Is capital there or liquidity needs. Is disclosure to stockholders in AIG that in fact those assets are walled off and cannot be used uh, and as, the, as part of the problem here is they discovered that the insurance assets were protected, the market started to adjust and caved AIG? That's a very sophisticated statement. And I think there is some, there is some uh, truth to the, I, I, don't know, I don't know because I'm not in their minds, but certainly there is, there is a, I think a good realization among policyholders across this country that the, the operating companies are relatively walled off from that kind of activity. In your state insurance fund, uh, we have, uh, I met with one company that's in danger of, <coughs> of going under an insurance company because they had too much Fannie Mae uh, stock. Um, do you have an inventory uh, as a state insurance regulator of how exposed your insurance companies are in Fannie Mae? Because right now preferred stocks probably worth zero. Common stock certainly is. We do, we, do, we do constant examinations of the company. We have one of the reasons I think insurance companies have done well is there are fairly strict rules and accounting standards, which Lynn and I could, could try, about what insurance companies can buy and hold in their asset liability match. Uh, the worst, I'll just tell you right now, the worst exposure that an insurance company could have right now is some, but, but, but the percentages that we've looked at are very low, some exposure to what had been AAA rated CDOs, the famous AAA rated mortgage backed CDOs, but actually the default levels of those is still relatively small. So if you can hold them to term, you may be okay for an asset liability match. This insurance company, I believe, had 25% uh, Fannie Mae. Um, do you have a guideline in New York on Fannie Mae? Yeah, I don't. As I sit here today, I can't answer that. I do know that we do have a bureau that sort of specializes in rehabilitation of distressed insurance do, companies. Do you? Um, if, if uh, I was trying to go through the different guarantee funds and so on, yep. if insurance companies would start to need to be rescued, do you have a, a fee much like we do for FDIC yes. and others that the insurance companies would kick in? Yes, we have what's called, that's very, yeah, you're, you're being very helpful, and, and, thank and you. you. We have, have what's called a guarantee fund, yes. Do you have right now, um, because I would assume everybody should be going, because one of the debates here is can the states do this as opposed to the federal? Yes. Uh, have you, uh, it sounded like you were looking at but did not have a, a clear uh, analysis of the Fannie Mae exposure, but other exposures that you have so that you could have an idea of your kind of plan at the state level if the economy continues to tank, if more of these uh, risky uh, uh, purchases that didn't seem so risky, because even Fannie Mae, just mm -hmm. in it, this summer, was assured by the Department of Treasury yes. that the investors were told, hey, this is great, and then all of a sudden it collapses. How, how are you dealing at the state level? We have, very, we have very frequent reporting through our Capital Markets Bureau. We regulate over 1,000 companies, so I can't, on any one company, I can't sit here and tell you what the numbers are. We do have in place a system where if there was a distress, we would bring the company into what's called rehabilitation, which is a form of bankruptcy proceeding to protect the policyholders so the capital is there to pay off the loans. If there's a shortfall, there are, as you pointed out, both life and property guarantee funds behind those. What bothers me about the whole AIG episode the most from what I do for a living is I think it's, 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 it's a broad misunderstanding bordering on the inappropriate that people would use it as an argument that there needs to be federal regulation of insurance. I actually have been open to the discussion of federal regulation of insurance. I've testified several times in front of Chairman Kanjorski's committee, and I think I'm one of the more open to those ideas. But AIG is exhibit A for how well the states did, not how poorly they did. And that has to be, I think, said clearly, because it's bad for policyholders if they think that actually their regulators did not execute well on that part of the industry. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Sauter.
Uh, Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Let me follow up on that, Mr. Dallo, and, and Mr. Souter makes the point. You noted in your written statement that AIG is, holding, is a holding company and it owns a variety of insurance and other businesses. And, and Massachusetts Insurance Commission was quick to share with me the fact that uh, the, the problems at AIG uh, are really those that deal not with its insurance subsidiaries, but with its operations in a holding company. Those are the financial products division, the securities lending division, uh, and that area there. The state regulated insurance subsidiaries remain solvent and able to pay their claims, correct? Yes, sir. And in fact, it's that solvency and ability to pay the claims that really gives the basis for the federal loan and the comfort that will be paid back. A absolutely. Okay. Now, your office regulates insurance of cities, not the corporate parent. The only agency with authority to regulate the corporate parent is, in fact, the federal office of thr thrift supervision. Is yes, that, that right? was a choice by the company right. back, I think, a few years ago. They could have chosen us. Yeah, they could have chosen a, uh, a regulatory agency that would have been more difficult to deal with, somebody that probably would have supervised them better. I, did, I didn't say that, Congressman. chose to deal with the Federal Office of Thrift Supervision, which is not known for its expertise in this area, and we should get that on the table. But the committees obtained a letter that the Office of Thrift Supervision sent to the AIG Board on March 10th of 2008. According to the letter, the agency criticized AIG's management and AIG's oversight of its subsidiaries, including in particular the Financial Products Division. I'd like to read from you a part of the letter and then get your reactions. The letter says, we are concerned that risk metrics and financial reporting provided to corporate management by AIGFP and other key subsidiaries may lack the independence, transparency, and granularity needed to provide effective risk management oversight. It also says a material weakness exists within corporate management's oversight of AIGFP's super senior credit default swaps, CDS, valuation process and financial reporting. And lastly, it says that AIGFP was allowed to limit access of key risk control groups while material questions relating to the valuation of the super senior CDS portfolio were mounting. So it wouldn't let in the people that would deal with this and it kept that secret. Now, the, obviously it says the oversight of key divisions has failed and that AIG apparently didn't have a full understanding of the risk taken by the financial products division. As an insurance regulator, I imagine you spend a lot of time assessing how well companies manage their risk. So let me ask you, do the problems identified by the Office of Thrift Supervision sound serious to you? Uh, I would, uh, if I author such a letter as a regulator, I would view those as very serious allegations, yes. Well, the letter also says that AIG's outside auditor, PricewaterhouseCooper, Pricewaterhouse Cooper, had reported the same criticisms to AIG's risk management and lack transparency issues. Things were so bad that the agency decided to downgrade AIG's risk management rating, its earnings rating, and its composite rating. Mr. Danilo, can you tell us what that means in layman's terms? Uh, it means that they were, un I guess, if they, I don't know where they downgraded it from and to, but it would indicate that they had some kind of enterprise risk management matrix and they brought them down at least a notch on how they were managing those core risks, which would, again, be something for concern. And Mr. Turner, you indicated at the beginning of your testimony you think we ought to be looking at what went wrong here, and I agree. What's your reaction to the agency's conclusions about inadequate controls at AIG, and what does it tell us about the corporate governance there? Uh, given the fact that AIG had been going through numerous restatements and literally since the beginning of the decade have said they've had errors in their financials, to get a letter like that out of an agency saying you had those type of risk management problems I think is uh, extremely serious. Uh, I would agree with uh, Mr. Danello on that. And I would say that you've got a serious problem from the top down, tone at the top. People just aren't given enough uh, attention and, and aren't serious enough about making sure these things are dealt with. And, and in an organization this big, uh, that can bring an organization down. And obviously, you know, there is a contributing factor here. So I think it's very, very serious. So when our two next witnesses uh, take the stand and tell us it's all about mark to marketing and, uh, and circumstances beyond their control, in fact, management very much was a part of this problem in, in your understanding. Is that correct? Uh, I, w I would totally agree with that. Thank you very much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Tierney. Uh, Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, th thank you both. I greatly appreciate uh, your, your explanations, your descriptions. Uh, this is very helpful, not only just for the American people, who, but for all of us in Congress who are taking a look at, 
at what do we do next and, and how do we approach this, what other hearings are, are necessary. And in looking at your, your written testimonies, um, <clears throat> Mr. Nala, you say that um, uh, using its non-insurance operations, AIG, just like many other financial services institutions, invested heavily in subprime mortgages. And then, Mr. Turner, you say, and I love this paragraph in your written testimony, um, you say you're talking about mark to market. And I, that comes into play because of the issue of subprime mortgages and the securitization of, of the, secure, um, the mortgage backed securities that, that were having to be marked to market. You see, I note the banks are requesting a moratorium on their fair value report card, but they are also requesting $700 billion of Americans' money to bail them out for the bad loans they made. And they want both. And you go on to say it's a red herring, that obviously if it was just marked to market, um, they wouldn't need both the shift on mark to market and, and the cash. And then you conclude um, here, um, ultimately it's no different than someone who spends more than their paychecks each month, indicating that the bank spent more on assets bought or created than they are subsequently getting paid back. And that brings us back to the subprime mortgages. And that's why I think it is so important that we have additional hearings on Fannie and Freddie and the subprime uh, mortgage area. And I've got a question of about that for you, and I, I want to tell you what the experience is in my community. Uh, yesterday when we had our um, hearing on Lehman Brothers, uh, we had a panel that spoke beforehand and they said that this all comes from a period of easy credit, housing prices escalating and then declining, securitization of mortgages, people using their houses as ATMs, and uh, of course excessive CEO compensation was, was cited. In my community, subprime mortgage lending, predatory lending, has had a decimating impact on neighborhoods, families. So we're at the forefront of the foreclosure crisis. In 2001, our community held a hearing on predatory lending. City Commissioner Dean Lovelace uh, pushed for this. There was legislation uh, passed to try to deal with it that was ultimately um, knocked down. But the um, the community experiences about 5,000 foreclosures a year, Ohio, about 80,000 a year. Um, every three years, that's the size of an entire congressional district that we, that we see uh, being foreclosed. But the experience we found in those hearings and what's happening in Ohio is that many times these are loans where the, uh, the loan origination amount exceeded the value of the property. It's not mortgage values declining, although they are now, which is compounding the problem, but that there was systematic efforts to give people loans that were in excess of the value of their homes, many times capitalizing the fees, many times giving them terms that either had escalating uh, in rates or, or payments that got them into difficulty, and then also economic conditions causing them not being able to keep up, up with payments. Then having a house that has a greater mortgage than the value would result in abandonment and, and foreclosure. Um, Many of the things that we hear about in this, uh, what we should do and, and what has happened, fall in the category of you know, bad business judgments or areas of regulation. But to me, loaning people val a loan in greater than the value and then securitizing that and not disclosing that, the loan, that there's a gap between the loan value and the, the value of the underlying asset should be if it's not a crime, and I believe that it is. And I think ultimately when we start looking at all these things, we're going to find that, that there were real crimes committed here that real people stole, and that had a big impact on our economy. Uh, what are your guys' thoughts on the subprime mortgage crisis that has brought this about? What are some of the things that we should be looking at, practices like this, that might lead us to uh, how do we stop these practices? Because in the bailout, Congress did not stop the practices that got us here. I <clears throat> I would amend one of my earlier answers. I was asked what are the things that I would have the Financial Services Committee look at working with you, and I said CDSs, and I said Graham Leach Bliley. Uh, the third would be that there is only so much good risk in any community. And we have permitted through securitization underwriters to basically do a set of loans to their community and then re-up the tank for doing more loans an endless amount of times. So the first set of loans that were CDO, the first set of mortgages performed very well, and that banker probably said, you know, I, there's, a, a, there's at least twice as many loans that I would have made because I got great people in my community. I want them to own homes, but I had to make some tough decisions. And a banker on Wall Street securitized it, and the second set did really well, and those were made with proper underwriting due diligence decisions. After the sixth or seventh or eighth iteration, for however we got there, I think that there is a basic fundamental issue 
with people not owning the underwriting risk of their decisions. They have to have exposure to their underwriting risk. And if you put into place a system where they no longer have to worry about whether they get paid back on their loans because they've handed it off to Wall Street, who's handed it off to investors seven, eight times, um, you will, th we will repeat this again. Mr. Uh, I'd, I'd agree with uh, Eric on this one. The disintermediation that the banking regulators allowed to happen to where whoever was lending the money no longer had any skin in the game uh, and you got paid handsomely for doing those type of deals uh, is a major contributing factor here. And I think you got to go back and look at the regulation of uh, uh, the mortgage uh, brokers. Uh, certainly the appraisal process uh, is going to be part of that, but I think people have to go back and, and say, as a matter of public policy, we all love securitization because it gave everyone a chance to get into a home. And no one was complaining about it when we gave everyone the chance to get into a home. But when we loaned up 100 percent on those values, and there were a lot of those home, I think there's something like 55 million of these of which 10 or 12 to 13 million are now in foreclosure. Uh, clearly something wasn't working out about them and someone needs to go back to the banking regulators and, and they've done some work on this, but people need to make sure that they've done enough work to make sure those type of loans can't be made. And then the bigger question of the role of securitizations, which quite frankly Fannie and Freddie play a big role in here. Uh, ha have we got to reexamine that policy and say if there's securitizations, do we have enough safeguards? The underwriting that occurred on them was, and due diligence by the investment bankers was atrocious, and that played a role as well. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I just want to make the additional point that most of the ones, uh, the loans that went into default in my community were actually refinances where the, the family had the American dream, but that someone went back and sold them then a product uh, that, that they could not maintain. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Turner. Mr. Higgins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Gentlemen, I'd like to uh, talk to you about internal audits of independent AIG auditors advising the CEO of AIG of a precarious situation that wasn't reported uh, to investors in a conference call. In fact, the internal audits warnings were ignored and an optimistic picture was painted relative to AIG's financial situation, which I think goes to the heart of credibility and trust, or in this case, lack of credibility and lack of transparency. For example, there was um, an all-day conference on December 5, 2007. During this investor conference, Mr. Sullivan painted an optimistic picture of the firm's management and fiscal health. He said that we are confident in our marks and the reasonableness of our valuation methods. We have a high degree of certainty in what we have booked to date. However, according to internal minutes from the Audit Committee meeting on January 15, 2008, AIG's independent auditor, PricewaterhouseCoopers, raise serious concerns before this investor meeting took place. At this meeting, auditors warned Mr. Sullivan personally back in November in preparation for the investor conference. Here is what the minute said. Mr. Ryan, a PricewaterhouseCoopers auditor, reported in light of AIG's plans to hold an investor conference on December 5th, Pricewaterhouse Coopers had raised their concerns with Mr. Sullivan and with Mr. Benzinger, the chief fiscal officer, on November 29th, informing them that PricewaterhouseCoopers believed that AIG could have a material weakness relating to risk management in these areas. Mr. Ryan expressed concern that the access that the enterprise risk management and AIG senior fin finance officials have into certain business units such as AIG Financial Products Group may require strengthening. At no point during the December 5, 2007 investor conference did Mr. Sullivan mention these warnings from the auditors. He never disclosed them. Mr. Turner, 
you used to be a senior official at the Securities and Exchange Commission. What do you think about Mr. Sullivan's failure to disclose the auditor's warnings to investors? <laughs> there, if you go back and look through the filings and go back and look at the third quarter filing for the period ending September 30th, and Congressman, you raise an excellent question. You don't see any notion of the fact that this company probably doesn't have the necessary models to be valuing this stuff. And uh, so if you look at September 30th filings, there's no indication we don't have the, the ability to value these things in the way we, we do, or no indication that you don't have controls. You're still saying things are fine. You go then to the communication from PricewaterhouseCoopers and then to a meeting with the with uh, an Investors' Day meeting on December 5th where we are saying things are okay, we don't have a problem. If you are an executive and you have known by that point in time that you got these disclosures out at September 30th saying, in essence, we don't have this problem, and, and while this is going on, keep in mind, you also, as I understand it, have counterparties to these derivatives starting to argue, and I think, in fact, there is some disclosure that by October 31st, people were questioning their valuations. So it is not only that you have got a September 30th queue out there, you have now got questions from outside parties, not only the auditors, but very well, you know, Goldman Sachs might have been one of them raising the questions, uh, back to the questions that Mr. Kucinich was raising. If you have got an outfit that is probably no one better in the world at valuing this stuff, like Goldman Sachs raising questions about these values and your auditors are now raising your value, I think it is unconscionable that you go out to the investors on an investor day and pretend like you got yourself under control and you know what all the numbers are and there is no problem. And subsequent events turn around, I think, pan that out when you say you got $5 billion in collateral at, at the end of December and then up to 14 and now we have borrowed 61. It raises a serious question of, about was anyone on top of this? I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Higgins. Mr. Yarmouth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. T uh, in the Chairman's opening statement, he said we were going to ask questions about the compensation packages of the uh, CEOs at, at AIG, and so I'm going to ask that now. You said in your uh, written testimony that uh, one of the problems here is that we had CEOs walking away from a train wreck, essentially, with huge severance packages. and. We we've seen or heard many times now that uh, the first in the uh, the fourth quarter of um, 2007 fiscal year 2008 fiscal year the um, loss posted by AG was 5.3 billion dollars and shortly thereafter that the compensation committee of AIG met and extended the contract of CEO Martin Sullivan and including a 15 billion dollar severance package. And um, I guess my question that most every American would have is, is there any way that the corp a, a compensation committee or corporation could justify that type of activity as being responsible in the best interest of the stockholders if there was such a dramatic turnaround and loss in the corporation and then granting a very generous package in light of that? Um, I, I'm a believer that if a company has performed well, the executives should be compensated well for that. Okay, so I have no problem with people if they've done very well and created a lot of value. Uh, like I said, I chair or I'm on the board of two of these investment funds. If they've created a lot of value for our shareholder, I certainly am one that would support them getting tremendous compensation. On the other hand. Uh, when you don't perform, having been an executive, I don't believe you deserve a bonus. I mean, if you've had a lousy year, you just shouldn't get a bonus. And then to walk away and get paid millions for walking away and doing nothing further to create value for us as shareholders, I think, is just wrong. In this case, uh, the question probably goes back to did the board agree to that agreement when they first put Mr. Sullivan in place? Uh, that was a probably not a, a high mark for this board. Twice I flew to New York and met with their then chairman of the board, Frank Zarb, and, and uh, uh, seriously questioned 
uh, how they had gone through the process. They didn't go through an outside search for a new chairman. They just very quickly selected and put in place with very little due diligence uh, uh, the next chairman. And quite frankly, then when you put in place a severance agreement with the guy and agree to it at that point in time, even if things turn out bad later on, you're committed to it and you need to honor a contract. But for the board to have put something like that in place is uh, just shows very, very poor uh, governance. That I, and then very was, poor. And it was compounded uh, subsequently because the next quarter the, the loss was um, almost $8 billion, so that's $13 billion in two quarters. And at that point they terminated Mr. Sullivan but uh, allowed him to retire so that he could re uh, <coughs> receive that bonus if they had terminated him for cause then he wouldn't have received it, as I understand it. So is that something that you would consider to be in the interest of the stockholders or in, in his interest? Um, again, whenever you are paying someone for walking away from the company where they are not creating any further value and haven't been creating value, that is certainly not in the best interest of shareholders. Thank you for that. I have, I have a question on going back to these credit default swaps that I would like to get some clarification on. We, talk, we threw out the number, or you threw out the number, $62 trillion that's out there. Who is that? Is that $62 trillion of potential loss? Is it absolute obligation? Uh, is somebody going to have to pay $62 trillion at some point to somebody, or is that just a potential loss? And to whom is that owed? I mean, in general, to whom is it owed? The $62 trillion, which, by the way, I believe has come down to the mid-50s at this point in time. It's only $55 trillion or $57 trillion, you know. But uh, you raise an interesting question because I don't think anyone really knows what the real exposure is. That's the nominal value or the, the, the amount of debt uh, that these things have been written on, although the actual amount of debt is actually substantially less than this, as Mr. Nanello mentioned. Some of this is nothing more than wagers of bets against one another in, in uh, trading, and that is a fairly significant portion of that. But no one knows because there is no disclosure. There is no central market. Uh, and, and this isn't the first time this thing almost came apart. The Fed in 2005 had to bring about 17 of these institutions together because they had gotten so far late in just doing their paperwork, no one knew who owed what at that point in time, which goes back to your question, then, does anyone really know what is going on here? And the answer is probably no. No one can tell you what is going on. There is no regulation, there is no opacity, and no one can answer the questions with a high degree of uncertainty because there is no place that gathers that data. This is this is a, just a very overly simplistic statement, which will not hold in practice. But there's an argument that the total notional value of CDSs should not exceed the total face value of corporate bonds out there. Because if you bought insurance for all corporate bonds that anybody owned, it would be. And I'm going to make up a figure. I've heard something like 15 trillion, 17 trillion. I, I, I may be six. I'm being told six. Well, I'm I'm an optimist. So. So if you think of it that way, that's why we say 10 percent. Remember, originally I said 10 percent. So if it's 10 percent of 62, so yeah, 6 billion is the right number, 90 percent of it is written on just, you know, going to the track and putting a bet on whether Ford is going to fail or not. It has not represent uh, a, a securitized bond exposure to the companies. If I can ask just one question, follow up. So it, this is one corporation, in this case AIG, betting against another corporation on, on value that doesn't exist. I mean, they're wagering money, wagering presumably shareholders' money, and in this case it may turn out to be taxpayers' money, on basically you and I betting, you and I betting on a football Yeah, game. just just technically it went, I just, I'm correct, I, I'm only going to correct you to the extent that it kind of went the other way. People, they sold protection as a triple-A or double-A rated vehicle. They sold their protection to those who wanted to take a bet on whether um, Ford was going to say, I'm just making that up, I'm picking on Ford, it's unfair, Ford was going to default or not. And when they got downgraded, this is, I think this is an important fact that didn't really come out, when they got downgraded, 
The reason they had the liquidity crisis that we've all discussed is when they got downgraded, they had to put collateral behind those obligations. When they were a certain high rating, they didn't have to post any collateral. So getting back to the Congresswoman's point, uh, what's it, all, all the more frightening about all this is there's no there there. There's no collateral behind any of these for A, AA, and AAA rated companies. And that's a big, that's a big number that there may not be, you know, backing for. Thank not you. the case for insurance. Thank you, Mr. Yarmuth. Uh, Mr. Braley? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Donalo, I want to start with you. Uh, Twenty-five years ago, I was a research assistant to Professor Alan Whitus, who was updating the Keaton and Whitus basic text on insurance law. And I think both Professor Whitus and Professor Keaton would be rolling over in their graves seeing what has happened to the industry that they were so passionate about. And I think you would agree with me that that industry has changed radically in the 25 years that I have been talking about. Yes, in particular going from mutual companies to Absolutely. publicly traded companies. And a lot of those demutualizations resulted in a significant financial loss to policy owners who owned the shares of those mutual companies, who owned the mutual companies and during the conversion in many cases were screwed out of their financial share of those companies. Um, I might not use the same verb, um, but I will agree. I think you get my point. But there's a well. I think it's important for everyone to know there's a very strong tension between policyholders' interests and shareholders' interests in a publicly traded company. The board and management has a fiduciary interest to po to shareholders under our law, fiduciary interest to shareholders. But at the same time, whenever they release capital to satisfy that, to get a bigger return on equity, they are necessarily taking incremental protection away from policyholders. Yes. And they also have a fiduciary obligation to policyholders under their contractual obligation with the policyholder. Yes. Sadly, there is some debate, actually, because they have been so they have been so trained under our law and after Enron, et cetera, to worry about fiduciary duty to shareholders that there is a good argument that, they're, that uh, although it is in their blood to worry about policyholders, the legal requirements are a little bit gray, actually. Well, one of the things we know in your opening statement, you said AIG was not strictly an insurance company, and that is one of the big problems, because insurance companies are fond of talking to consumers about gaps in coverage and how they should eliminate those gaps. But based on both of your testimonies, we have got a massive 63 trillion dollar gap in coverage where we've got a product that according to most common sense interpretations would be considered insurance. We're not regulating it in the state insurance commissioner's offices. We've taken action in Congress before I got here to declare that it's not subject to gaming regulations, which again under the Constitution are historically made by states rather than by the Federal Government, and you have eliminated any oversight from the Securities and Exchange Commission, which has the only Federal capability to exercise jurisdiction over these companies. So I wish how did I, we get here? I wish I could have said it so clearly. I, I, don't know, I, I don't know how we got here. We thought it was important to permit leverage. We thought it was important to permit risk mitigation, and we thought that mega holding companies were accretive to shareholder value and to be competitive. And I will say that we are, that one of the big issues is but after Basel II and what's called Solvency II, which I'm sure you've heard of, we are in danger of going the European route, which is a lot more holding company control over the operating companies, which is code for much more ability to move around policyholder money, that's, uh, that's, that's what we're talking about, around for holding capital liquidity purposes. If AIG had been under a Solvency II regime, um, I would think we would be in much worse straits than we are today. But one of the concerns I have is this blurring distinction between financial services providers, real estate, insurance, banking, other financial institutions, and how you hold accountability when these holding companies are involved in all these different financial services because clearly the system we have in place now is not working. Is it time for Congress to revisit the fundamental premise of the McCarran-Ferguson Act and talk about a Federal intervention that takes into account the need to have some oversight of insurance companies that choose to engage in risky financial propositions like the ones we have been talking about today with no ability to have accountability to their shareholders? Earlier, I said we should. I think I would recommend a revisitation of uh, Graham Leach Bliley and this concept of supermarkets when you're dealing with policyholder money and depository commercial bank money. 
I'm not sure I will just remain agnostic whether the solution is a federal oversight or continue with the states or some hybrid because I think that it is important to have states in the solvency business. They have done extremely well on that. They have done not so well clunky on other things like product registration and licensing of agents. We are pretty clunky on that. But the one thing we got right and the reason that we are even here today to the extent there is optimism here is because there was solvency done by state regulators. And just to follow up on Mr. Souter's comment about the guarantee funds, you would agree that most state insurance laws provide a cap on those guarantee funds, typically in the amount of $500,000 or surely a million dollars or less. And when you are talking about an exposure of $63 trillion, that would have no impact to protect taxpayers. <clears throat> Actually, New York is one of the richest guarantee funds, and I think the numbers you just described are New York numbers. Most states are, I don't this is not to be pejorative to other states, but most states are substantially lower. Some people think that lower is better because it stops the moral hazard of writing bad policies because there is the, always the guarantee fund behind it. But yes, it, it would have been a real stress on the system, undoubtedly. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Braley. Uh, Mr. Uh, Davis? Thank you. Do you think anybody ought to go to jail over this? Let me take a stab at that. I think anybody ought to go to jail over this. Uh, to, uh, to whom is your question both of you. directed? Okay. Both um. of you. I'm not asking you to name anybody or build a case, but I'm just saying, looking at the end results, how the companies operated at this point, were they all within the law, or did somebody break some rules along the way and just nobody caught them? I don't. I don't have sufficient. I don't have sufficient evidence to have an opinion about it. The only thing that I would say is I think that as a regulatory society, so to speak. We all did kind of chase after mortgage default numbers. In other words, some of what was described earlier about the escalating losses at AIG was certainly a, a default rate loss. In other words, we have all seen how the rating agencies have hugely changed their ratings based on how quickly the default numbers are coming in for mortgages. And I am not taking a position whether it is criminal or even civil. But it is the case that a lot of us, including the best rating agencies, some of the best securitization people in the world, and some regulators, got wrong what was going to be the default rates, which it turned out our global economy was hinged on. Well, if it wasn't criminal, was it at least negligent in some areas? Um, I, I, I won't even opine on that, but I would say that I did say that, 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 that the letter, if true, that I heard is something that you would be concerned about. Yeah. Mr. Turner, you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, Congressman. Um, I don't think you send people to jail uh, for making bad business decisions. That happens day in and day out, and people shouldn't be prosecuted for that. On the other hand, if uh, someone uh, knew there were problems in the company and failed to comply with the security laws and disclose those to investors who bought them and are now seeing their retirement savings go away and disappear, and uh, then, yes, I'd turn around and say, Little, little time behind the bars would well, probably be good. Let me ask this. How about the people writing the mortgages? You talked about the first tier and the second tier and how it got lax. I mean, at the end, they weren't even asking tough questions. Yeah, no, I think the term is a ninja, right? No income, no job, and no assets or something like that. It's unbelievable. Um, we were harvesting uh, mortgages at a rate that I think is completely unacceptable as a society. And we were in various ways encouraging people to engage in underwriting decisions that um, I find shocking, frankly. Right. In fact, didn't AIG, they got caught up in this. Their competitors were doing it. They started a new line that they had not and no expertise in used an insurance model and it just blew up on them. Is that basically what happened? I think to a large extent people did not. We rely, this is what I was trying to say before. We relied on historical default rates in housing that maybe for the first two iterations of loans was wholly appropriate. By the seventh or eighth, we had basically injected we correlated the system because we weren't take we weren't we weren't securitizing natural loans. We were securitizing created loans. Now your argument, as I understand it, is that the Commodities Futures Modernization Act, in retrospect, uh, went too far. That was a, a mistake. Th that's that's what I, th I think. That's a fair implication of what I said. Yes. And that was signed just on the eve of the 2000 election. I think it passed Congress. Uh, yes. Fortunately, I did not support it. But as I was looking at, at the just going through the votes and everything, uh, it was signed right on the eve of the 2000 uh, election. Uh, obviously, some modernization was needed because there was a huge congressional and, uh, at that point, uh, administration consensus. But you think it just went too far? Is that 
You wouldn't argue there shouldn't have been changes. It just think it, in retrospect it went too far. No, it was just absolute. It says this act shall supersede and preempt the application of any state or local law that prohibits or regulates gaming or the operation yeah. of bucket shops other than anti-fraud provisions. Yeah. I, I, I agree. Um, what about the Reauthorization Act this year? Did you follow that? That was reauthorized this year. You know, you know how they reauthorized it? They no, attached no. it to a farm bill, an agriculture bill, which was vetoed by the President and overridden in Congress. And that's how a lot of these things get done. I think members said, oh, this, you know, that, so that's how a lot of this business uh, uh, gets done. What about Graham Leach uh, Bliley in retrospect? Again, that was done in the, uh, uh, over eight years ago. Um, in retrospect, uh, obviously a need to modernize Glass-Steagall. Would you agree with that? Yes, some some need, but I but I'm not. I, yes, but I've learned a lot through this process. Well, let me finally ask: Should the SEC or should Congress have stepped in much earlier to suspend the market-to-market -market accounting rules as a way to head off some of the problems we're experiencing today? Um, I think Mr. Turner would be better qualified to answer right, that. I'll, I'll just say that insurance companies do it a different way. Insurance regulars do it a different way. It's much more conservative and fortunately beneficial, I think, to what we're talking about. Mr. Turner, you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I don't think Congress uh, should step into into that. Uh, as the, as I mentioned in my testimony, the GAO found uh, actually supported going to mark to market and believes that when you suspend it and you avoid, uh, when you allow a bank to turn around and have losses, okay, and not tell us as investors about it, I got to tell you, we ain't got any confidence in the system or, or, or trust. And and if Congress goes in and says we're going to let you hide those things from us, I got to tell you, you're going to see a devastation in this market. We will not be investing in financial institutions if you do that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, uh, Ms. McCollum. Oh, Mr. Chairman, can I just ask you unanimous consent that members be allowed to submit statements on for the record today? Uh, without objection, that'll be the order. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Turner, Mr. Delano. Um, Ms. McCollum, I can't hear you. Could you speak more into the mic? Mr. Turner, I have it on, sir. Can you hear it now? Can you hear now? Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Turner, Mr. Delano, uh, AIG didn't suddenly collapse and need to be bailed out on September 18th. <laughs> yeah. AIG's financial situation had been growing increasingly dire with each passing quarter, but AIG's executives kept telling shareholders that their finances were in great shape. And in fact, Mr. Uh, Chair, I'd like to submit a New York Times article dated September 28th, uh, which uh, enumerates time and time again how these uh, people said AIG was in great shape. In December 2007, for example, Mr. Sullivan told AIG investors, quote, we believe we have a remarkable business platform with great prospects that represent tremendous value. Two months later, AIG posted $5.3 billion losses for the quarter. In February 2008, Mr. Sullivan said, based on our most current analysis, we believe any credit impairment loss realized over time by AGI FP would not be material to AGI's consolidated financial condition. Then AGI posted $7.8 billion in losses for that quarter. On May 28th, Mr. Sullivan told investors the underlying fundamentals of our core business remain solid. The next month, the board voted to replace Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Turner, I have a couple of questions. What do you think of Mr. Sullivan's statements? Do you think they accurately reflected AGI's conditions? And Mr. Delano, I'd like to know if you have a view on that as well. Mr. Turner, um, in your uh, written statement, you said, and I'm going to quote you, trust and confidence in markets and in any company begins and ends with transparency. Transparency that ensures investors can fully understand the assets and rewards of investing in a company. <coughs> Should be able to trust what the CEO is saying. So if you gentlemen could please um, uh, elaborate. As you go through these filings and you look at the, 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 the disclosures that start to occur and, and the time frame in which they are, the one thing I take away from this is I don't think the company ever was honest with the investors about the magnitude of the potential impact of these things. And I think that is what is is grossly missing here. And then as things start to go bad, they go bad very quickly. And we are finding out about everything, not 
prospectively, here's what could happen. And keep in mind, the SEC rules are very clear. They require you to tell the investor, right through the eyes of management, what's happening with the company. And I don't think we ever get that out of here. I don't think the rules uh, were followed. I, and I, I just think it's astounding that all of a sudden you're borrowing $61 billion and yet you've never told the investors up to that point in time, hey, we've got these credit derivatives out there that could cause us such a problem that we could come short. And granted, the market goes down, okay? And, and certainly people were not wishing for the market to go down the way it was. But nonetheless, when you got that type of exposure and that type of potential, you, you owe it to me as an investor to tell me that's the type of risk I'm taking on when I'm investing in you. You've got this thing that may all of a sudden blow up and cause you to need tens of billions and you can't get to it because all the cash is in regulated subsidiaries that Mr. Dinello is appropriately trying to protect. And that's the disclosure that just I cannot find in these filings. And uh, I, you know, the SEC and the DOJ, I hope, will go through, get the emails, get the data, and, and then everyone's entitled to their day in, in court and due process. But right now, there's a question there that I can't answer for myself as to why we didn't get that. Mr. Gelano? Um, obviously, I have to be um, sort of, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not informed enough on the, at the holding company level on some of the disclosures to have a position about this. I think I did say earlier that I w witnessed sort of a, a very um, um, a, um, um, shocking realization as to the liquidity needs of the company on that weekend, and I was surprised that some of the risk was being rolled up um, at that sort of contemporaneously at that time. Um, I will say just one observation that we, we just touched on, um, which I didn't, which is one of the lessons learned. Um, there are these things called lines of credit that every company has and they assume they're there in these liquidity crunches. But what's kind of interesting, I think, that the committee should know about and financial services committee should probably be told about, is if you touch them, you get a three-notch downgrade from the rating agencies. And so they're kind of fictitious in some ways. I don't mean this badly, but people have them and they convince us that they have this line of credit that will help them through these tough times. But if, God forbid, you need to hit the $15 billion line of credit that these companies have, the consequences are such that you might as well not have them because the, you might as well have gone through the downgrade because you're going to go through it for touching the line of credit. So I think there was sort of, you know, we're all learning together to some extent. Um, and I think that that's uh, one of the lessons that I would just kind of inject in this. Th thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the hearing because I think this is clearly showing people were gambling. They weren't investing with uh, the dollars that uh, these investors had. Thank you, Mr. McCollum. Mr. Van Hollen. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you both uh, for your testimony today. Uh, Mr. Mr. Turner, I just want to follow up on uh, my colleague's, Mr. Yarmouth's questions. He asked you about some of the golden parachutes uh, that were available for Mr. Sullivan and others uh, at AIG. I want to talk about the regular compensation and bonus uh, plan. And as you state in your uh, statement, uh, you talked about the dangers that bonus plans that are, quote, designed to pay executives hundreds of times what their average employees made as they engaged in business that would eventually cripple the business that they ran. Uh, and you hear a lot of talk from some of the CEOs about how they have these pay for performance uh, plans that in the good times they benefit, but when times are tough, uh, they take a hit. And I think the more we look at these different companies like AIG, you find that they rig the rules so in good times they do well and in bad times uh, they do well. And I would like to uh, get your opinion of the actions of uh, a AIG's former CEO, uh, Martin Sullivan, at a meeting of the company's compensation uh, committee on March 11, 2008. Uh, the committees obtained documents uh, of that meeting. Uh, AIG has two bonus programs. The first is called the Partners Plan, uh, and that covers the top 700 executives. Uh, the second is called the Senior Partners Plan, and that applies only to the top uh, 70 executives. Mr. Sullivan uh, benefits from both plans. Now, according to the plans, uh, and again, if you listen to what they're saying, uh, rewards were supposed to be based on the company's performance. Uh, but I want to show you, uh, or at least mention to you, I don't know if we have it on the screen, but uh, we have the internal meet minutes of the meeting that was held uh, by AIG's Compensation Committee on March 11, 2008. 
Uh, and as you can see, uh, what those committee meetings show is that Martin Sullivan, who was CEO at the time, personally urged the committee to waive, to waive uh, the bonus rules uh, right after the company posted a record loss. And as you can see, that what the minutes say is, Mr. Sullivan next presented management's recommendation with respect to the earnout for the senior partners for the 2005 through 7 performance period, suggesting that the AIG FP, that's the final pro financial products uh, division, that their unrealized market valuation losses be excluded uh, from the calculation. Essentially what he's saying there is the rules, if we applied them, wouldn't let me get my bonus, so let's change the rules. Isn't that right? Uh, that's the way I would read that. All right. And this, uh, this comes on the heels of the February 8th, 28th AIG posting of losses of $5.3 billion for the quarter, which came primarily from the Financial Products Division. Isn't that right? Yes. Okay. So, and, and the record also uh, makes clear that, in fact, uh, the board, not surprisingly, agreed with their CEO, and he got his $5.4 million bonus, despite the fact that AIG uh, ran up $5.3 billion in losses uh, in the quarter uh, before. I, I just have to you know, ask you, you know, because people, people understand when people get rewarded for doing well. Uh, but everybody else out there operating the economy, when, when, when they don't perform, they get their pay cut, they get fired. These guys, there is absolutely no accountability. So I'd like you to, to comment on the kind of changes that need to be made, in your view, to make sure this kind of thing does not happen uh, going forward. And then, Mr. Dinell, I'd like any comment you've got. Uh, as someone who uh, has followed governance and, and read many of these type of, of plans, quite frankly, when I was uh, running the research at Glass-Lewis, uh, this is not an isolated occurrence. We've seen this time and time again in corporate America where uh, you set up a pay for performance plan, but then when you didn't hit the performance triggers, you changed the triggers. You didn't say change the compensation. And there's just fundamentally something wrong with that. And that's one of the reasons this institution, quite appropriately so, I believe last year, voted and approved uh, the say on pay proposal. Uh, that is a middle-of-the-ground proposal and a very, very good proposal. Uh, it's unfortunate. I know it was in one of the drafts of the bailout legislation and didn't stay in it. That was a very unfortunate. But I think uh, certainly we need to have in this country give the shareholders the vote an opportunity to pay on this, uh, or, uh, vote on situations like this uh, with full disclosure so you're aware this type of stuff is going on. And I think only by doing that are we going to get this reined in. I think anything short of that is going to leave these plans in place, leave this type of behavior in place, and people are going to continue to be outraged about it. You are not going to get the changes that you need. So when we have say on pay as investors, when we invest in the U.K., when we invest in Netherlands, when we invest in Australia, but we don't even have that right as investors here in the U.S. There's just something fundamentally wrong with it. So we need this institution, the House, and we need the Senate, by golly, to follow your good leadership on that and pass the say on pay proposal. Now. Not a year from now, but now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Thank you, Mr. I would only, I, I would only add that a lot of Wall Street and traders and I think AIGFP is analogous to this, are paid on a revenue basis as opposed to an end of year profit basis. And there is something to that. And you can, you know, create a lot of revenues without actually booking a profit sometimes. And so that is something that people have written about recently, about sort of changing that approach to compensation for certain financial services activities. Good. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Van Hollen. Mr. Sarbanes? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm trying to understand this um, in, in the context or in terms of uh, how we got all these toxic assets infecting the markets out there, which at the end of the day just gets back to this, this insatiable appetite to generate new loans. And when, when there weren't enough loans out there in the conventional market, uh, we then had these people that were reaching into the 
unconventional market into a very, very risky market, um, and that created this, this toxin that went up the chain. So my interest in what AIG was doing is to the extent that it was, it was seen as providing the hedge slash insurance backstop to these Wall Street firms that were increasingly getting into the business of trading in, in very unstable or risky uh, security products. Um, with the effect, I, I take it, and I'd like your view on this, with the effect that um, it, it increased their risky behavior and that gets pushed down the chain. So they begin to encourage more and more risk on the front end. And once you've relaxed the underwriting standards on, on the front end of the thing, um, it becomes very difficult to continue to manage the risk up the line because the, the original thing that you've created um, in and of itself is unstable. Um, so talk to me about that. Talk to me how what the product that AIG was offering basically led to riskier behavior on the part of these um, Wall Street firms, which in turn led them to encourage risky behavior all the way down the chain. Mr. Denala. Well, I think, I think, Congressman, you sort of said it in there. They were arguably at the end of a chain of exceedingly uh, ridiculous optimism about the value of these mortgages. So people harvested the mortgages. They securitized them. The rating agencies rated those at the highest levels and through CDO squared AAA. Traders at various trading houses held them. And then wanting to prudently, arguably, have a default protection on those bought a credit default swap from certain guarantors, AIG being one of them. So I would say that at some level what AIG did was it gave kind of it was the last line of defense with its high rating, I think it was AA at this time, saying, well, the rating agency is rated at AAA, so we'll even guarantee it against default. And uh, one of your points I thought you were sort of making was if any, maybe if anyone in that line of activity had acted with, uh, I'll, this will be a little bit impolite, but acted with common sense instead of models, they might have said, this doesn't feel right and I'm not going to put my reputation, assets, shareholder value, rating at risk for this. Well, you had two things happening. You had, you had a bunch of people along the way who could keep offloading the risk to somebody further up the chain. Yep. So then they have no incentive themselves to stop or curb their behavior, particularly if they're making money off the deal. Then you start getting to the end of the chain, right? The people that are actually holding these securities at the end of the line. And the way they, quote, offload the risk is to go insure against it. So they turn to an AIG as a way of doing that. And I guess in the initial iteration of that, maybe it made sense. But then you have um, AIG basically opening a casino in London, right, to start this other activity. So at what point would, at what point should the, the investors that were purchasing this as an insurance policy, should they have known that AIG, their, their quote insurer, was getting into this other risky enterprise? Did they know that? Did they realize that they'd opened a casino in London and and something else was going on that was putting their policies, we're, quote unquote, at risk. You, we're mix. I just want to clarify. I think we're mixing the term insurance policy somewhat loosely. You, when you ask that, you mean the the people who had actual property life insurance, the, the common man and woman who had life insurance policies and property policies with AIG. Is that no, what no, you meant? No, no, no. I'm talking about the insurance product that was the CDS uh. to the extent it was because it began that way. Right? Yeah, but it, it always, began, but my understanding, Congressman, it was always out of financial products. Right, but it be, what I'm saying is it began as a legitimate, quote unquote, hedge against the downside risk of this particular security that you hold. But the reason it got up to 55 or 62 trillion or whatever it was is because it became a betting house. And what I'm trying to figure out is at the point that happened, no longer should I, as a, an yes, investor who was, who was hedging against the security that I actually own have taken I can, any comfort okay, I, I from think the I can fact that AIG. That. Yes. yes. I think that at AIG, most of the activity in the CDS was off of 
covered, non-naked activity. These people really own the CDOs. These were traders that own CDOs and they wanted default protection on the CDOs. But it is actually a profound <laughs> observation that the governor has made that for the 10 percent of people who thought they actually had capital and some kind of insurance protection behind those covered CDSs, it turns out that possibly the, un the, the, the continued unregulated activity that is naked could seriously impact their ability to receive payment. That's what I think that's what one of the Congress people was I think that's what Congresswoman Maloney was very concerned about before. Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Welch. Thank, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate your testimony, very informed and very helpful. Thank you. A couple of things. One, uh, Mr. Turner, I think you said that the SEC Office of uh, Risk Management was reduced to a staff. Did you say of one? Yeah, when that gentleman would go home at night, he could turn the lights out in February of this year that we had gotten down to just one person at the SEC responsible for identifying the risk at all the institutions. So that included the $62 trillion credit uh, default swap? That's correct. And how did he do? Well, I suppose he got the lights turned out but didn't get the uh, problems taken well, care of. You know, it reminds me, we had a hearing earlier on uh, in this committee uh, about these tainted toys. Kids were uh, buying or they were getting toys that had lead paint. And it turned out that the uh, Consumer Product Safety Commission apparently had one person, I hope it wasn't the same person, uh, inspecting all the Chinese imports. Yeah, in all fairness to the SEC, see, the staff over there uh, that I've dealt with over the years have been uh, excellent. But when you only have one person, there's, there's, there's no way on God's green earth anyone, Chairman Cox or anyone else, could have even imagined that this person could do the job. When you cut it down to one, you know what you're doing. You know that you're basically saying we're not going to do the job. Yeah. So is, was there a systematic uh, depopulating of the uh, regulatory force uh, so that it was impossible actually for uh, regulation to occur if you have one person in that office? And then I understand that 146 people were cut from the enforcement division of the SEC. Is that what you also testified to? Yes. Yeah, I, I think there has been a, a, a systematic gutting or whatever you want to call it of the agency and its capability through cutting back a staff. We talked about risk management, we talked about enforcement, but as, as well just in some basic fundamental policies, the enforcement staff are now asked to uh, jump through many more hoops before they can proceed with investigations. Right. Uh, a, ch a change that's been written a lot about in the media and is is not a healthy change for the agency. All right, you you and your testimony, and I think it was really supported by Mr. Danalo, identified a number of things that have contributed, and there is plenty of blame to go around. The executive compensation, people coming and going, making money, the accounting standards being lax, cheap debt. <laughs> Uh, this whole unregulated casino-like $62 trillion credit default swap, handcuffing in the SEC, lack of regulation at the holding company level, failure of the Federal Reserve to tighten up on credit in the mergers that were too large. But I want to get back, uh, and that was quite a laundry list, and all things that we could act on. Uh, but on this specific question of having public servants in the job so they can do the job on behalf of the American public, would it be your recommendation that we've got to boost the personnel levels at these organizations to protect the consumer? Uh, unequivocally, uh, yes. I believe in the Appropriations Committee over in the Senate Banking, they've given them about a $30 million increase, and I suspect that that falls short. It probably is going to need to be, if you really want the SEC to do the job and they're you're serious about it, given the cutbacks that have occurred in the last three years or so, you're probably going to need an increase in at the SEC realistically, more in the range of 50 to 75 million. Right, or and that's paid for by that SEC transaction fee. Yeah, the, and, and in fact, the SEC collects more in transaction fees, substantially more in transaction fees from businesses than they actually pay out. Uh, 
for their costs and their staff. Let me ask you this. Some of us uh, have suggested that there be a SEC fee or transaction fee that would go into an escrow account to offset any cost to the taxpayer of this bailout. Is that something that you have an opinion on? I've, uh, I've always believed that the SEC, from a funding perspective, should be treated solely as an independent agency and that the SEC be given the ability to collect its fees and whatever it collect it spends on that and uh, that those fees don't go elsewhere. They just basically go to fund the SEC so that they don't, uh, you know, they get what right. they need but not more than what they need. Mr. Danalo, how about you, both on this question of personnel to get the job done and establishing uh, basically an escrow fund to help offset the cost obviously of the bailout? Obviously, I'm a big fan of hiring regulators. <laughs> um, I think the department is, I think we're well, you know, we have a, a lot of, there's a, a, hundreds of people who do what they do at the New York State Insurance Department. It takes a lot of people to regulate closely. I think it is definitely the case that you can design a system. I certainly feel independent in our work, but we are, we are a net, uh, we are a net. Thank you. You I, know, I, so I think I think you can do it. One last question for both of you. I, yeah, I appreciate without, your answer. Without 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 costing the taxpayer any money. All right. There are a number of companies that are going to uh, participate in this bailout program, and my question to you is this: Do you believe it would be right and appropriate for the taxpayers to have the right? to claw back some of these outrageous executive salaries and gold, golden parachutes uh, from companies that have voluntarily opted to participate in this bailout? The provisions that are in the legislation, um, you know, does under what I would consider to be limited si situations allow uh, clawback. Uh, but people need to understand it's it's limited. It's not everyone. I thought right. it should have been everyone, quite frankly. That's what I'm no, asking. Yeah, I mean, not, we have another crack at this. I mean, this was a gun at our head piece of legislation that we had to pass. We were told in order to avert a catastrophe. But we have an opportunity to improve it, and we're going to have to. So, would you support a stronger clawback provision? Uh, yes, and I've communicated with members of Congress already that I think the clawback provision, the severance provision. Uh, there were three provisions there in compensation, and they all could have been much stronger than right. what was done well, the first go-around. Mr. Danalo, how about you? I, I don't think I have enough of a basis to give an opinion. I thought Congress did a pretty good job the first time around, but I'd have to see some kind of a proposal to, to know for all such instances. Okay. Thank you. Thank You're you, welcome. Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Welch. Uh, Ms. Spear? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Danalo, I am one of those that believes that the regulation of insurance companies should be at the state level. And if there ever was a great example of why it works, it is AIG because the insurance part of AIG is solid. Now, having said that, uh, you as a regulator have the authority to conserve, to take institutions into conservatorship. And once you do that, uh, my understanding is, it certainly is in California law, that you know, all bets are off, contracts are off. You are there to make sure that the corpus is protected for the policyholders. Is that correct? Yes. All right. In this, uh, yes. In this situation, we now own AIG. The taxpayers of this country, for all intents and purposes, own AIG. It's in conservatorship. Mr. Cassano, who was the, the golden boy of the casino in London, um, had his compensation um, very attractively devised so that over the course of eight years he actually earned more money than the CEOs, um, some $280 million because he was getting 30 cents back for every, uh, on every dollar he was receiving 30 cents back in terms of the products that were being sold. So um, he also was eligible for uh, bonuses. He was eligible for $34 million of what were unvested bonuses. But in February of this year, he took um, that company, that division down to by $5.3 billion. Uh, and yet, he was fired the next day. And the following week, the committee has a copy of a letter that's a contract, I uh, presume, here that confirms this agreement in which he was given the $34 million. And oh, by the way, he is now on 
contract as a consultant to the tune of a million dollars a year, and we, the taxpayers, are picking up that tab. So here's someone who brought the company down. The taxpayers now own this company. It should be in conservatorship, and this man is still getting a million dollars a year. Now, if it was in conservatorship as an insurance company, you would be able to void those contracts, wouldn't you? Yes. Let me inter let me intervene just to say it's a million dollars a month. Excuse me, a million dollars <laughs> a month. Yes. <laughs> if those if those contracts were Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for that clarification. Yes. If those contracts were with an operating company that we brought into rehabilitation, which you would call conservatorship, we would have a, we we do have incredibly potent powers over policies and contracts of the company. We basically step in and become the management at our you know salary. So that fancy conference in California could have been stopped under those circumstances? Uh, yes, although I presume, yes, that's, although, again, that's, we're talking about holding company activity. So, Mr. Turner, knowing what we know, knowing that Mr. Cassano now is getting a million dollars a month paid for by the taxpayers, even though he's no longer working there and he did get his bonus even though he didn't earn it, um, do you think we should claw back? Well, there is always the legal question of legally what you can or, or cannot do. Unfortunately, one of our problems is we paid out, or investors are quite frankly going to pay out, and now, as you mentioned, taxpayers, time and time again. It's not just this situation. It's this situation, as you aptly describe, others that other institutions, Merrill Lynch, Countrywide and the likes. And if there was a way you could find legally to go enact legislation that would allow clawbacks of those sums where there was absolutely pay and no performance, if not destruction, I would be a big fan of it. And the, the real question is legally whether or not you could, could do that. I would certainly say, though, we've learned a lesson and let's not repeat it again and let's go fix this going forward as well. If you can do something in the past, I'm sure I've heard from a number of my uh, uh, fellow neighbors that they'd love to see you go get what you couldn't back from the past as well. One last question to you, Mr. Dinello. You determined to take $20 billion from the insurance company and give it to the holding company. Yes. Um, explain to us why you did that. Did you think that that was going to be enough to hold them over? Yes, so we didn't actually do it, but we did at a certain point offer to do it as part of a holistic solution. We did believe at the time that the liquidity problem of the downgrade that I talked about before was on the order of $15 billion, a need for liquidity. So there was a plan to take what was excess surplus. This is an important point. There's the asset liability match, promises versus assets held. There's a statutory surplus above that, and then there's excess surplus even above that, which companies often have the right to decide how to use. And we thought that prudently we could loan that essentially through the property and casualty companies to fix the liquidity problem on the basis that the life insurance companies were going to be sold, which is part of the AIG plan or, or some companies, to re pay that loan. So at the time, the governor thought, given AIG's presence in the community, the number of jobs at stake, et cetera, that that was a, and given it was not in any way going to put policyholder protection at risk, it was a reasonable use of excess surplus. Ultimately, we didn't need to do it, but that was the beginning of that weekend where I was called in and the governor sent me in to um, understand how we could be uh, pragmatic on a liquidity basis. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Spear. Ms. Watson. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for this opportunity to uh, have the public listen in as we try to unscramble eggs. And Mr. Delano, Mr. Turner, thank you so much. I don't know if your responses are, are really doing that, but at least I hope at the end of these series of hearings, we as the policymakers will have a little more clarity as to where we need to go forward and what we need to do. Uh, Mr. Turner, uh, in your written testimony, you told the committee about AIG's disclosure on May 2005, that, uh, 2005 that it had inadequate internal controls. 
You also said the errors overstated AIG's income by approximately $3.9 billion. And, Mr. Turner, AIG has had a history of internal control problems. Uh, would you say that is true? Uh, yes. Okay. As part of the Committee's investigation, we reviewed internal minutes from AIG's audit committee meetings, which are not public. And these minutes show that the company's independent auditor, Price Waterhouse Coopers, warned the company as recently as this year that there were significant problems and that these problems were growing worse. Now, here are some of the examples, and I, they might be up on the screen. Uh, as of uh, February 7th, the meeting of the Audit Committee, PWC warned that the role and reporting of risk management needs a higher profile in AIG. And at a February 26th meeting, PWC indicated that the process of, uh, at AIG <coughs> seemed to break down in that, uh, and it was kind of unlikely that other companies where there was good dialogue at appropriate levels of management on the approach, alternatives considered and key decisions at AIG only, AIG FP was involved in the December valuation uh, process. At the next meeting on March 11th, PWC reported that there is a common control issue <clears throat> and root cause for these problems and that AIG does not have appropriate process or access or clarity around the roles and responsibilities of critical control functions. Mr. Turner, as a former SEC accountant, do you consider these deficiencies serious? Can you elaborate? Yeah. Um, again, going back into 2007, there is obviously some questions about whether the company at a time it had disclosed, and, and in all fairness to the company, they had disclosed that they had a half trillion uh, uh, in nominal value of these derivatives. They didn't tell people just the magnitude of what that could turn into, but they had told the public they had a half trillion. But in light of that and the fact there was some very, very serious concerns about the models and where they could do the valuation right, which was would raise the question of could you actually disclose something with integrity, I think the, the, the things that PwC is telling the company here are extremely serious. Uh, if I was, uh, I would, I must say though, if I was sitting on the audit committee, uh, and I've chaired a couple of audit committees, one of my concerns would be obviously the company was, has been doing credit derivatives for quite some period of time. And now all of a sudden we're just seeing it from the auditors for the very first time as we get down to a very critical stage and things are in essence imploding on us. I would have the question for AIG management, one, why hadn't you solved the problem before now? Why didn't you have the systems in place to make sure you could get your hands around these and get the right disclosures? But I would also have a question for PwC, who had been for a number of years auditing the internal controls. Why are you just now coming and telling me about this at December, November, December of 07 going into 08? If I was the audit committee chair, I'd feel almost blinded that the auditors hadn't come and told me about this uh, beforehand as, as well. So, and, and quite frankly, if the auditors were just coming and telling me this as CEO, if I was sitting there in, in Mr. Sullivan's position, I'd be raising the same question with the auditors. Okay, and I'd just like to get Mr. Denal's opinion on this too as well. Um, if I think that those are, I, I think those would certainly get my attention. Uh, whether they were rectified or not, I can't say. So I think it's, I think it's important. I, th I think you want 
outside auditors and risk management to come in and make those kinds of assessments. And the way you should, this is my modest opinion, the way you should judge sometimes is what the company did in response. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you, Ms. Thank Watson. You for the time. Mr. Yeah. Shays. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Turner, Fannie Mae had assets ranking at number two. Only Citigroup had a larger asset ranking. Freddie Mac ranked number five. Just to give you some perspective, GE ranked number 11, Goldman Sachs number 12, Ford Motor Company 15. That was in the year 2002 when I introduced a bill to say they need to be under the SEC. Did it ever strike you as curious that the second highest ranking asset company uh, in, in the marketplace uh, and the fourth were not under uh, any oversight by the SEC? I, I just think it was just flat out wrong. That's the only way to say it. I think someone that's selling that much of this, you know, in the securities market and trading and being held by uh, public investors, I think unquestionably it should have been from the get-go underneath uh, SEC regulation not would, exempted. Would you take issue with uh, Federal Chairman Alan Greenspan's warning to Congress in 2005 about the growth of Fannie and Freddie portfolios when he said, so I think that going forward, enabling these institutions to increase in size, we are placing the total financial system of the future at a substantial risk. Would you disagree with that? Uh, at the beginning of 2007, I think these two institutions were doing somewhere in the mid-30, 35 percent of the total mortgage loans in, in, in the country. And by September or so of last year, it had gotten up to about 75 to 78 percent. There is no question as that risk expanded. And, and keep in mind, the decision was made, quite frankly, going back into the late 90s to allow these two institutions to grow they, the way they did. If you allow them to grow, you have got to make sure you have got adequate controls and processes around them. So we the, had and a, regulator, and quite frankly, and we had a weak uh, regulator named Ofeo, that a very fed, weak regulator. The Federal Housing Enterprise Regulatory Reform Act of 2005, under the previous Congress, passed, and was sent to the Senate. It would establish what we basically did in 2008, but when it got to the Senate, it was unanimously opposed in committee by, candidly, the Democrats. And therefore, it never had a vote on the House floor. Uh, when I introduced this bill with Mr. Markey, it had 22 co-sponsors. And one of the individuals, when we were talking about having a stronger regulation in committee, said that this was a political lynching because we were questioning Frank Raines and his uh, oversight of this committee. I want to know, do you think that somehow Mr. Raines, who got $190 million, do you think that somehow uh, he should be exempt from coming before this committee if we're going to have others with uh, less responsibility getting the same sums? If you don't want to answer, you don't have to. No, no, no. You asked the question and the question's fair, okay? First of all, I go back to what Congresswoman Maloney said at the beginning, this is not a partisan issue. And as I said, this issue needs to be dealt with on a bipartisan basis. I think you need to drain the entire swamp, Congressman, and I think you need to take a good look at what went wrong at all of these institutions. Freddie and Fannie are two humongous institutions that we have had a bell out here and it has an impact. And having worked with Ofeo on both of those institutions, I would encourage you to bring the executives, the appropriate executives right. and appropriate this, board members before the committee. In that bill that we sent to the Senate, we had a clawback provision to be able to go back after these outrageous salaries. Would you recommend that that be part of any bill? Uh, as I said earlier, I am a big supporter of the clawback. What was in the bill was exceedingly weak to the extent that Congress can determine that there is a legal, an, an, an appropriate legal remedy to go back and give power to someone to claw back uh, for prior severance. 
where there was no performance, I would certainly uh, support that. Thank you, Mr. Turner. The gentleman yields back the balance of his time. Uh, I agree with you, Mr. Turner, that this, this should not be a partisan issue, and that's why I was somewhat taken <coughs> aback when the Republicans on the, some Republicans on this committee started making a big deal about Freddie and Fannie. It is an important issue, um, and, um, and they're right. And our committee staff has been already looking into this thing, and we are going to hold a hearing on it, so I think it's appropriate. We'll have to ne negotiate that with the uh, minority uh, to get a day that would be convenient for the staff, but obviously we're going to do it. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Shays talked about a bill that he introduced, which you thought was a good idea. I'm a co-sponsor of that bill. And uh, some of the uh, uh, proposals that uh, have been put forward, Democrats and Republicans have supported. Unfortunately, some of the proposals have not been agreed to, as, as we were discussing with the clawback provision in the, in the Barney Frank bill uh, that was just adopted. Uh, we would have wanted it to be stronger. The, the transparency provisions that we suggested to uh, Chairman Frank, as well as uh, 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 some of the other provisions that you've mentioned that we ought to adopt, we've also recommended should have been in that bill. When you do legislation, you get what you can. You don't always get what you want. But I, I want to I thank both of you for your presentation. I think you've been superb witnesses. You've educated this committee enormously. And I have to say about the members on both sides of the aisle, I thought the questions have been asked of the two of you in the conversation, that more of a conversation than anything else, has been very, very constructive and, uh, and generally nonpartisan because these are not partisan issues. Our country and our economy is at stake, and therefore uh, we've got to work together and not look for, even though we're short time before an election, election opportunities to try to zing the other party. These are not the kind of issues that uh, ought to be put out of, for that, in my view, uh, uh, on a partisan basis. They're the kinds of things that we need to look at very carefully together. I don't know that there's a Republican or a Democratic response to abuses of shareholders and taxpayers, I don't think there's going to be any difference as we look at those issues together. And that's why we're holding these hearings to find out how we got to where we are and what kinds of suggestions we want to put forward for the future. We don't have the jurisdiction that the Banking Committee has, but we certainly can put ideas out there. And, uh, and I would hope that on a bipartisan basis, not only are we going to hold these hearings, but we may well come out with uh, some suggested proposals that I hope the committees in charge and the leadership of both the Democratic and Republican side of the House and the Senate will entertain. Would the gentleman I, yield for a question? Uh, yes, certainly. Thank you. I, I do want to compliment uh, this committee on the way they've asked their questions. I do think we are trying to get at the answer both on a, on a bipartisan basis. What is troubling to us, though, is uh, we scheduled five hearings and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are not scheduled. And uh, we didn't hear that you were even doing this investigation, which our side isn't a part of, uh, until we raised this question. Uh, is it fair to assume that we will have this hearing uh, uh, within this five hearing uh, range, or is this your intention to do it after the election? Well, well, we'll have to look at the schedule. We have, for the interests of the witnesses and the, and the public, we had a hearing yesterday on Lehman, which many people say triggered. The, the stampede. We had the hearing today on AIG. Uh, next week we're going to have a hearing on um, the rating, I think it's the rating agencies, and we're going to uh, have a hearing from the regulators. Um, and um, what, is, what am I missing? Hedge funds. And we're going to have a hearing on hedge funds because th they're involved in this whole new world uh, that our regulatory system did not anticipate. So uh, while we've scheduled those hearings, Members on the other side of the aisle said, well, what about Freddie and Fannie, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac? Well, we're looking at that in preparation for hearings. But I've, I, I will uh, work with the Republican staff and the Republican members to make sure that we have all the hearings necessary. And I think it's appropriate that we look at them and we will hold a hearing on it. And we'll have to discuss the date. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Davis. Let me just add that we look forward to working with you on that. I think Freddie and Fannie are huge pieces of this puzzle. And our testimony today uh, illustrates uh, that as well. Uh, it's a shame that the committees of jurisdiction didn't hold hearings on this 18 months ago. 
think we might not have been uh, in the bind we are in. But I very much appreciate uh, you calling this now and that we can examine what happened and what we might do as we move together in the future. Uh, thank you. I, I do want to mention that one of the reasons we hadn't scheduled that as the first hearing, as some members suggested, is that the Committee of Jurisdiction just had, held a hearing on Freddie May, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac two weeks ago with their CEOs. So we thought we would go into this uh, would, would in a gentleman different schedule. Just for a second question. Yes. Um, we have 100, uh, 360 degrees jurisdiction over every activity of government for investigation. We have no jurisdiction in any of these issues to promulgate legislation. So I, I just don't uh, want there to be the impression that somehow we don't have jurisdiction over Fannie and Freddie. We have total jurisdiction to in examine anything they have done. Uh, I don't think anybody would deny that. Well, we don't, we, we don't have jurisdiction over any. We have oversight over all. Oversight jurisdiction. But I think that was what the gentleman from Connecticut was referring to. You, you've been very uh, generous in your time and in your answers to the questions. Uh, Mr. Chairman, can I just say thank you very much? I think they are great witnesses. I think you have added a lot from both sides to the record. Thank you. And let me ask thank unanimous you. consent of the committee that all the documents and exhibits that have been referred to by members of the committee be made part of the hearing Chairman, record. Can I also just ask unanimous consent? I have got AIG's uh, PAC contributions over the last decade. They would be put in the record as well. Without objection, that will be the order. Thank you very much. Um, we are going to move on to the next panel, but we will uh, uh, break for sufficient time for the, the, uh, these witnesses to, um, uh, to leave and for the uh, next uh, two witnesses to come to the table. So we will continue on our committee hearing. John?